Welcome everybody to our workshop on ergodicity, six different uh, viewpoints. This day is jointly organized by uh, MIRA, which means Mathematical Interdisciplinary Research at Warwick, and uh, NISA, which is the National Institute for Economic and Social Research. And uh, just a short word about MIRA. This is a program at the University of Warwick to encourage and stimulate interaction between different disciplines uh, involving mathematics and others. So in <clears throat> this day, uh, it's particularly uh, relevant to economics and physics and uh, statistics, but uh, others are very welcome too. And we look forward to learning how different disciplines use the concept. So I'm going to pass to Roger now to say a few words on behalf of uh, NISA. So uh, uh, to be specific, uh, the, it's actually organized by uh, a, a rebuilding macroeconomics project, which is hosted at NISA, um, and um, which is um, a, a jointly, it's, it's a, a project funded by the ESRC. Um, uh, the way that we're going to organize this is we're going to have two uh, separate sessions. The first three sessions will be hosted by Ian um, in Melbourne, who I'll introduce in a second. The second three uh, will be moderated by me. Um, uh, each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll have uh, 10 minutes of, of discussion. And the moderator, which will be Ian for the first part and me for the second, uh, will decide whether or not to interrupt the speaker with questions uh, or leave them to the end. And um, if you have questions, uh, please type them into the chat function um, and th they will be uh, forwarded on to the, to the moderator who will then uh, act as a gatekeeper over the questions. Unfortunately, uh, we have to do that because of some unfortunate incidents that have occurred in the past um, with, with, uh, with Zoom. Um, I'd also like to say that Rebuilding Macro is putting on a series of exit strategy workshops specifically related to the COVID crisis. Um, and we have a, the fifth one of those coming up on Wednesday, uh, which will be uh, jointly organized by me and Megan Green, uh, and that's on modern monetary theory. So uh, with, uh, without any extra uh, ado, I'm gonna hand over to Ian. Okay, well, welcome everybody. So um, we're gonna start off with Juan uh, Garahan from Nottingham, um, who's going to talk about uh, equilibration, slave relaxation, non ergodicity and classical and quantum many body systems. Okay, okay hello. I, can, you, can you see me? Can you hear me? I'm, yes. Yeah. And I'm going to try to share my keynote presentation, let's see. So can people see the slides? Yes, we can. Good. And can you see my mouse moving about so they use it as a pointer? Yes. Yes? Okay. So, well, thanks a lot for the invitation and for, you know, allowing me to, to open the talks. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I suggested this general title on the equilibration, slow relaxation, and ergodicity, both in classical and quantum many body systems. And I was also told to try to set the scene. So what I'll try to do is um, mention some general ideas and questions that we ask in, in condensed matter theory, statistical mechanics of many body systems, and some you know, general view of how to address these questions, um, with an emphasis, of course, on, 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 on my own work. So I'll try to be as general as possible and emphasize concepts more than details, but you know, please ask me questions. Um, if you ask questions while I'm presenting, you know, well, the organizers will let me know, okay, how, how that's someone's asking. And um, so I will talk about two things. One is classical many body systems, and by this I will mean systems which evolve stochastically which are open and in contact with an environment, you know, thermal environments so or thermalizing systems. And then time permitting, I'll try to talk about quantum systems and um, those will have 
uh, unitary dynamics, so closed quantum systems with unitary dynamics. And this is work, you know, old work and new work, and then just you know, pick and choose from you know, some results produced with various people on the classical end, mostly with David Chandler from Berkeley, the late David Chandler, and uh, on uh, more recent work with uh, Mari Carmen Valiols, Ignacio Sirac, and other group in Europe. Okay, I'm going to next slide. Everyone saw the change. Just checking that this is working. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, when I what I mean by many body systems, I I mean systems of, of, of many degrees of freedom. And here this is just a cartoon of you know, part spheres at high density. So you have you know many particles, many atoms could be spins on a lattice, whatever that interact with some. Physically, physically reasonable interactions, typically short-ranged, and in this cartoon example of you know what would be a model fluid, um, it's it's excluded volume interactions between between the particles. So it's just a kind of motivate what kind of many body systems I'm I'm, I'm thinking about. So now, and let me move this about uh, outside. So let me start with you know classical stochastic or thermal systems. So you know, at the top, you know, now I'm using my mouse. Um, you know, I'm thinking of systems that evolve, um, whose dynamics are generated by some Markov generator. So let me use some, you know, some 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 terminology and, and formula here. I'm calling W, and um, you know, the probability evolves in time according to this integrated equation. So dynamics is generated by by this Markov generator W. I'll focus on that. I'll focus on that because it's 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 just simpler, you know, to describe in those terms. But you know, the things I'm saying also apply to discrete, you know, Markovian dynamics you know, or diffusions to an extent, and so on. And then, you know, when I'm thinking, and I think mostly about thermal systems and you know, evolution of this kind, you know, the probability. And I'm using you know standard physics notation, so the probability can be described as a as a vector. The probabilities of over, over configurations form the vector, and, and this is a vectorial equation. I use brackets and so on. There's nothing deep in, in, in using these, you know, quantum-looking notations. It's just a, just 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 a terminology. And then uh, under these dynamics, one expects that the probability, some some you know initial probability or some probability that time t it evolves and eventually goes to a stationary state, um, which here I'm calling p x. You know, for equilibrium. Let me just focus on equilibrium. But many of the things I say also apply to systems whose stationary state is not necessarily equilibrium. And here I'm just thinking, you know, thermal and, and the stationary state is naturally an equilibrium thermal state. And the important question will be, you know, what's the relaxation time? And I'll, I'll say more about this in a second. So there is some time scale tau, which is a characteristic time for the dynamics under the conditions being studied. And that I'm you know, calling the relaxation time. So, so then, you know, by ergodicity, I, you know, I'll work, use as kind of you know, working definition that ergodicity is about forgetting initial conditions in the sense that the expectation value of an observable over, you know, that stationary state, that equilibrium state, can be computed from long time you know, empirical average over a, a, an individual trajectory. So. In a sense, there are, and, and this is what we want to focus on, you know, there are, there are three possible situations for a many body system. One is when relaxation is fast, when, um, you know, correlation times associated with dynamics, with this approach to stationarity, is such that, you know, this characteristic relaxation time I'm calling tau, which is not the inverse of the spectral gap of, of this operator by some characteristic time, I'll, I'll say more in a second. It's not too different from you know the the, the, the the time scales defining the problem. So it's not a collective you know emergent property. So the you know dynamics is relatively simple and relaxation is fast. Then there is another regime where those time scales could be very, very large, but still finite. And that's slow relaxation. That's something I, I want to focus on, you know, in, in, in what follows. And where dynamics you know can have regimes, which I'll explain in a second, that one can um, pseudo stability that looks like the system will not equilibrate but eventually does but on very long times and then there is a third possibility which is that the system despite the dynamics is truly non-ergodic that the characteristic timescales are infinite 
And two things to say here. First of all, it's very difficult to distinguish between these two, and I come back to that in a second. The second thing I want to emphasize is that true non-ergodicity should occur when the number of degrees of freedom goes to infinity. And that's because one has to separate it from reducibility in the dynamics. If you know, time scales diverge without the system size diverging, that very often has to do with some un, you know, un, uh, unidentified, non-identified reducibility in the dynamics. There is something that gets conserved and one hasn't really identified and therefore thinks that not forgetting initial conditions associated to that conserved, conserved quantity is a sign of non ergodicity where it's really that the dynamics is not, uh, is not irreducible in the sense that the dynamics does not allow to connect the whole of state space. OK. So a typical example to think about these questions are classical glasses. And I know a lot of what we know about slow dynamics and uh, possibilities of becoming non-ergodic is comes from thinking about the problem of you know systems that we call glasses and those are you know fluids that are either cold or dense such that eventually they flow so slowly that they fall out of equilibrium they stop flowing on experimental time scales and we think of them as falling out of equilibrium okay so, so far, so good. People can still hear me and you know, it's, uh, see my slides. I assume yes, unless I have lost everyone. Yes. OK. I, I would like to make a point. Your yeah. ergodicity, you've lost a one over t. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. It lost, sorry, sorry. The equation lost a one over t of total time. Sorry, thanks. So. I mean, the only point I wanted to make there is, you know, this equating, a, you know, the, the sampling from the distribution from uh, the empirical average over trajectories. Thank you. So let me give you, you know, let's let's look at the curve. There are millions of curves of this kind uh, um, quantifying relaxation. So the details don't matter. These are, you know, old results from some, you know, uh, glassy fluid. And um, one quantifies relaxation through correlation functions, you know, typically, you know, like autocorrelation functions, the value of an operator at one time and the value of an operator at some time later, minus some, you know, disconnected part of that correlation. And what's plotted here is one of those correlators such that um, uh, at the beginning, the value is one, which uh, indicates that the system has not forgotten at all the initial conditions. And this correlator is such that at very long times it goes to zero. So, you know, full relaxation, forgetting completely about initial conditions, etc., is, you know, the process of this correlator going from one all the way to zero. And then, you know, what happens here and the example I'm showing is that depending on conditions, in this case controlled by temperature, again, details don't really matter, these correlators take longer and longer to go to zero. And they define a characteristic time. So, for example, for this green curve, you know, the time scale I was talking about, this time scale tau. Um, oh, sorry. So this time scale tau you know, can be defined in, you know, from the integral of that of that curve or from that curve crossing some threshold, etc. What one can see is that this time, notice that the the axis the abscissa is logarithmic, is getting longer and longer and longer. And if you see there is a separation of time scales, you know, these correlators dk they become flat or relatively flat before they decay much, much later. And then imagine that one cha keep, keep changing conditions and you know, experimentally or in some even numerically, one would have you know, a threshold, a maximum time over which one can observe. And this, oh, sorry, and this curve, you know, that plateauing might stretch up to that threshold. So then the question is, is the system truly non-ergodic in the sense that correlators have not fully forgotten about initial conditions, or the time scales occur much, you know, when, when, when this relaxation goes to zero, okay, occur much later. So what I'm bringing here is that, you know, in this trying to understand, you know, the interesting systems which have complex correlated, you know, emergent dynamics um, are very often slow systems, like, like in this case, glasses, and times can become very long. And then the question as to whether times truly diverge 
or not, you know, it's a moot point in the sense that you know experimental observations have you know a maximum threshold. So then you know, I'm trying to, you know, th those are the, the key questions, you know, when thinking in many body about slow dynamics where systems are ergodic, are slow and metastable, or truly non-ergodic in, in the sense I described before. So then how, how does one think about slow dynamics? And there are many ways to think about this. And you know, one possibility is that dynamics is occurring in some landscape, and I will go into no detail at all, and which is rugged. If there is disorder in the problem, you know, that, that, that would be a natural way of thinking. Um, and the perspective I want to take in the next five or so minutes is what I'm calling a dynamical one, where it's not a rugged landscape. There's nothing spe special about configurations. Like here, you have some configurations which say higher or lower energy, free energy, whatever. It's really the connectivity of configuration space. So dynamics is complex and maybe slow because configuration space is connected in a particular way. It's difficult to connect configurations that superficially look close to each other. And if one thinks of hard spheres, that's a typical situation. And again, there are many, you know, these are old ideas and there are some reviews here on, on, on this topic. So now, I do statistical mechanics and in StatMech, what you do is you try to, you know, reduce, you know, these key concepts to the simplest possible models that capture the ideas and then you try to study them ex 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 exhaustively. So that's what I'm going to do now. So now, our way to, um, to, to make concrete this idea of connectivity or configuration space is what are called kinetically constrained models, dynamics with kinetic constraints. So what's a kinetic constraint? So here we have some uh, stochastic system as before, and explicitly I've written the stochastic generator. And the generator I've written here is one that flips spins independently. You have a constant rate at which you flip spins. And this is what you do when you do Monte Carlo on the, on, in your computer. And this dynamics is totally trivial. And on the left, on the bottom left, what you see is a trajectory. You know, the, you know this, this system of binary variables evolving in time. And the stationary distribution is just, you know, the equal measure over all possible configurations. So it's an unconstrained dynamics. A kinetic constraint is changing the rate at which this local process, this flipping of spins occurs to some function. And an example I'm giving you here, which is important for glasses, but never mind, is what's called the yeast model. And the yeast model is one where you can only flip spins if your neighbor is in the up state. So this plane likes to flip, the rightmost spin, one wants to flip to zero or vice versa, can only do so if the neighbor is also in the up state. And that's because the rate is zero if the neighbor is in the down state. So now, this dynamics has the same stationary probability distribution, but the trajectories are completely different. And there are these very, very large fluctuations in space and time. So it's an indication of very, very strong fluctuations and correlations in the dynamics. The dynamics is now highly correlated, even if the stationary state is not. So it's a way to, yeah. But into, uh, I think Robert Mackay has a question he would like to ask. Sure. So Robert? Uh, yeah, this was one I was going to raise <clears throat> at the end, given that we passed the point, but um, distinction between stationary and equilibrium is something that it would be good if you would comment on at some stage. Oh. Because so in economic, stationary... the words are used differently, you see, so this is yeah. part of what we need to explore. So by stationary, I mean the probability that, that's uh, invariant under the application of the generator W. Yeah. And in this particular case, um, the stationary state is an equilibrium one. Because this generator and the generators and the operators have been considering obey what's called a detailed balance. And uh, in that case, the stationary state is a probability uh, that we call equilibrium. There are no probability currents in the stationary state. There are several conditions that are obeyed by equilibrium. Is that enough or you want? I have my iPad here. I can write. Yeah, that's I okay. Can. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so I'm focusing exclusively on equilibrium in this classical part. Okay. The stationary state, the stationarity, the invariance, 
probability distribution is, is an equilibrium one. So all I wanted to say here is that constraint dynamics, in const local kinetic constraints are a mechanism to generate these complex dynamics without changing the nature of the stationary state. And then what occurs is that, you know, what I was just saying is that if one looks at trajectories of the dynamics, there is a coexistence between regions of space and time where there is there are a lot of spin flips and regions where there are very few spin flips. So these are these very, very strong correlations in how the system, spatial correlation in how the system evolves dynamically. And then one can quantify that and maybe Rosemary Harris will talk a little bit about things related to this later, I don't know, um, you know to these general methods of analyzing trajectories a long time. So one can do these statistics, one can generate all possible trajectories of these dynamics and quantify each trajectory by how many spin flips there have been in each, in, in, in each trajectory and then calculate the probability distribution. And what one says is that there are, you know, these distributions are very, very broad. And this broadness at a statement, uh, at an, oops, uh, sorry. And this broadness of this probability distribution are a quantification of how fluctuating the dynamics is. So when one has slow relaxation, something that's tending towards non-ergodicity, it you know, makes you know, reaching the station, stationarity, forgetting initial conditions very take very long, the dynamics is spatially heterogeneous. This is something that we see all the time. Yeah. And one mechanism that auto, you know, automatically gives you this are constraints in the dynamics. So now, you know, this, um, I haven't gone into details, I just want to emphasize, you know, this idea how you can get slowness, but then, you know, this is, the, one can take these ideas further and just look at experimental data for liquids and, you know, it's, it's it, you know, this is, this, is some, this, this is a way of thinking about these problems, which is, 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 is very good at, at, at describing the, the, the dynamics that we see, you know, in, in, in the lab. So I have two minutes according to my clock, or maybe not. So you know, chair person will tell me. It's okay. So let me say something very quickly about quantum dynamics. What I've tried to emphasize now is you in many body were interested in understanding whether systems um, relax, forget initial conditions. Uh, those are the, you know, the that's the situation we would think of of you know as a system being ergodic. Um, and then we want to understand whether um, situations where the dynamics can be slow and perhaps so slow that you never forget about the initial conditions and then uh, yeah, you, you become non-ergodic. And I emphasize this mechanism of constraints, local spatial constraints on the dynamics and the emergent slow dynamics is also, so, so, you know, strongly spatially fluctuating. So let me say something very quickly about quantum systems. Um, uh, and these are syst many body systems evolving with unitary dynamics. So not in contact with a thermal path, not stochastic. So I'll say three things and then I'll, two things and then I'll stop. So the first one is that this has been a lot of activity in the last 15 years. Um, quantum systems are, you know, one can prove this. In general, they quote unquote equilibrate. This is not in the same sense I was using before. In, you know, in, 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 the, in the quantum realm, equilibrate is just that if you run dynamics, unitary dynamics with some, you know, generic Hamiltonian, and you observe expectation values of observables, over time they become flat. Yeah, so that's the statement about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement about stationarity of observables. But this doesn't mean that the observables don't depend on initial conditions. However, people believe that most quantum systems thermalize, and I don't have time to go into the detail, but the idea is that one has a big closed system and looks at a subsystem. So subsystem A, at long times, the expectation values within a, of operators within A are very close to what one would calculate if one assumed that B was the um, that, that that the system was thermal at the initial energy. So B obeys behaves as the environment of A. And this is called thermalization. 
And this is what's called quantum ergodicity of many body systems. Is the is 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 this statement about thermalization that the effective state of A is as if one had a thermal state in in the whole system and trace away the degrees of freedom from B. Well, while most of the systems do these, there are two exceptions, and I'm about to finish. One are integrable systems. Integrable systems are systems which have a very large number in the sense of a number that diverges with the system size, number of conserved quantities. So the, those conserved quantities prevent thermalization in the sense I'm describing above. And another is a class of systems with very strong disorders, sometimes called many, often called many body localization. And it's still not fully clear whether case two is strictly non-ergodic, but people believe that there is a transition to non-ergodicity. So the only thing I was going to say is that the, a third possibility is when you have quantum systems with constraints, quantum kinetically constrained models. And these are systems without disorder. And I'll just leave the, you know, the final slide. So um, one can go back to this very simple example, the one I was calling the East model, and consider instead of a Markov generator, a Hamiltonian operator, and look at unitary evolution, and by things, you know, I can go into the details, by analyzing the spectrum, one can see that this, um, in this system, under certain conditions, um, um, the system behaves in a quantum non-ergodic way. And I will stop there. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, so, um, so I don't know if the system's working, apart from Robert, I didn't get any questions so far. Are there any questions? Apparently not. Um, so yeah. Well, maybe maybe a, a general question, which sure. is um, to what extent the the concepts that you've been describing have analogs in, say, economics. Um, so maybe the, the quantum case is uh, is a <clears throat> purely physical thing. Though I know there are there are quantum uh, theories in economics. I forget now by whom. But if we take just the uh, Markovian stochastic evolution, mm -hmm. then uh, to what extent does this connect? And maybe it's a question more for Roger than for you. Yeah, well, yeah I, I mean, I found that enormously helpful. Um, because, and you'll see why, I think, when JP talks in, in the second part, because there are many analogs in, um, I think, what you're calling the, the, the first part, the non-quantum part with the way that we're thinking about uh, the transmission of beliefs in economic systems. And it took me a long time to understand um, the difference between, I think, what you're calling relaxation dynamics uh, and what uh, JP, I think, I mean, he can, he can speak for himself in a second, but we're calling quasi-ergodicity, meaning that the system is eventually ergodic, but there's a very, 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 very long time to get there. Um, yeah, if I if I can try to, you know, thanks for that. Let, let me try to, you know, to to add to what you are saying and what I said. Um, yes. So, um, so there are two questions here that we usually distinguish them, calling them reducibility of the dynamics and then ergodicity. Reducibility is that the dynamics allows you to connect configurations. And then a second question of ergodicity is how long does it take to connect those configurations? Um, and uh, does the time it take it grow with system size? Because when we think about many body, we always you know, think of the system of a certain size n, and then try to take that, that size to infinity. That's what we call sometimes the thermodynamic limit. Yeah. And then, um, I was I'm describing here's mark, uh, you know systems that you know continuous time Markov chains, so they are generated by a Markov operator W, and this operator has a spectrum, and there is always a a time that one extracts from the spectrum, which is the gap. Yes, this you know the largest eigenvalue seed of this operator, and then there is 
uh, the first negative eigenvalue and the distance is, is the, you know, the inverse, the distance is the gap. And that defines the time associated to starting from the most unfavorable state and how long it takes to get to typical state of the stationary distribution. Yeah. But the more important, or the, the, in practice, the more important time is what I'm calling the relaxation time. If I choose one configuration from the stationary distribution and I let it evolve, uh, that should spread into the stationary distribution how long does that, that take typically. Yeah. So these were these pictures I was showing here. Yeah, that's that's that, that's the that's the time scale we 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 often focus over. Yeah. Okay, so I got a question from Francesco Cochi about if you could say something more on the relation between relaxation time and inverse of the spectral gap of the generator. You said they're not the oh. same thing. Is there any relation? So let me show you, um, okay, so let me show you, oh, sorry, I'm, I want to show you a picture. So do you see that now, now I've, I've gone out of, of the PowerPoint, of the keynote. Do you see this figure? I'm circling a figure. Yes. So this is the same model I was talking about before, but instead of looking at dynamics in the, in the stationary state, I'm looking at dynamics starting from the system almost all spins down. So this is the most unfavorable state. Yeah. So now, the, the stationary state in equilibrium, the trajectories look like you know, they are full of, of up spins. You know, it's a, a density of up spins and down spins. So the gap in this example in, of, of the generator is starting from a configuration which is as, as far away from the configurations in the stationary state, um, you know, how long does it take to reach the stationary state? And what you see here is that, you know, it's, you know, in this particular model, you know, you, you start empty and you have to start creating, creating, you know, these up spins and eventually it's very full of those. And therefore the gap scales as the inverse of the system size because it takes a time which scales linearly in system size to do this, yeah? But the, you know, the, the correlation time I was describing before is the typical size of these bubbles. So now let me go back to, to there. Let me do this. Yeah. So now you have a trajectory, which is, you know, which, which is stationary. It's stationary and it's in the equilibrium because you cannot tell whether the, you know, if I inverted in time, this trajectory it would look the same statistically as going forwards in time. Now, the, the time scale tau is not, you know, the system size here is whatever, it's, you know, several hundred. If I made it even larger, you know, these bubbles, which represent the correlations in the trajectory, still of more, will be of the same size. And the time is finite because it's a typical time of these correlations. So it's not given by the, by the gap. Of course, it's bounded by the gap, but it's not given by the gap. Um, I mean, it's given by some other different combination of, 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 of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the, of, of the generator. And that's because, you know, it's measuring what, how long it takes, you know, to decorrelate, to forget about a configuration that started, uh, that was chosen from, in this case, the equilibrium, config, uh, the equilibrium distribution. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes thank you. Okay, so we have one final question from Alan Kerman. Would you like yep. to go yep. ahead? A very simple question that uh, when you were answering, um, Robert, uh, you said uh, there was a mention of the detailed balance condition without yep. anything else being said. But I just want to think about the real role of that and its relation to reversibil reversibility. Mm -hmm. you say something about that. Yeah, so uh, well, thanks for the question. So. I think the easy, to me, the easiest way to see it is here I'm showing a trajectory in equilibrium, yeah, in the stationary state. What do I mean? The initial, condi the initial condition was chosen from this stationary state, mm -hmm. yeah, and it evolves. So now, overall quantities like, you know, the density, I mean, how many up spins there are versus down spins will fluctuate, but will fluctuate around an average value. It's not denser at the beginning than at the end. 
But now, if you think of this trajectory, imagine I took the image and I reversed it. I can actually do it. Yeah. Let's see. So, so how do I do this? I take it. Yeah, and I will flip it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I inverted time. The trajectory looks the same. Right. Statistically. And that's you know that's the you know that, that's a pictorial way to understand detail balance. If if you are in equilibrium and you have this microscopic reversibility, uh, one way of saying it is that the trajectories in the forward direction, starting from the stationary distribution, are similar to the trajectories statistically in the, in the backward direction. If you had a stationary state which is driven, which is not equilibrium, for example, if you, if you had injection of particles on one end and ejection on the other. So then the particles might be flowing leftwards. So if I revert the trajectories, the inverted trajectories will have the particles flowing rightwards. And then you could tell, oh, you've reverted time. Yeah. So that's, I don't know whether that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. But I just think that in many processes in economic systems, you have the feeling that the detailed balance condition is a bit suspicious because of that reversibility. Um, so that that was just my sort of. Um, so, I mean, I mean, nothing. Of course, I showed examples where you know, just because we focus on systems in, in thermal equilibrium, but um, most of the things I said apply also if this stationary distribution, instead of being an equilibrium one, um, you know, was was just a non-equilibrium stationary state. Yeah. Okay. For example, if you have injection of you know particles on one end and an ejection on the other, that's what you would get. So, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks very much, Juan. And um, do we yeah. applaud somehow? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. So, um, so the next speaker is Mark Polycott from Maths at Warwick, who's going to talk about mixing resonances and Smooth ergodic theory. So, Mark, do you know how to get the screen? Uh, I hopefully can manage to do it, yeah. There it is, in fact. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll go full screen if we ask nicely. Uh, or not. I think it might depend on which window you're sharing, um, Mark. We'll discover, don't worry. There you go. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to uh, to speak. And uh, let me thank the organizers and say it's a great pleasure to be here in Kenilworth giving this talk. Uh, my wife is loitering outside the window. Let me just wave to her. Thank you very much. Okay, so I want to talk about kind of classical ergodic theory and um, some, some things related to that, in particular uh, resonances and the notion of mixing. So let me begin by saying a bit about ergodicity. So, of course, the word um, ergodic comes from the Greek and it comes from the work of Boltzmann uh, when he was studying statistical mechanics. And uh, here's a picture of Boltzmann with a particularly impressive beard. And the notion of the ergodic hypothesis is that you have some sort of system and it spends, uh, the amount of time it spends in general in different states should be proportional to the size of the state. And this is the notion of the ergodic hypothesis in some general sort of sense. So if you're interested in, in gases or something like that, then you could imagine having a, a large container containing an awful lot of particles. And then each of these particles has, um, uh, three different numbers associated uh, to its position and three different numbers associated to its momentum. And so its phase space is just given by an awful lot of numbers, maybe six times 10 to 26 if you have that many particles. So any particular configuration at any particular moment, I'll denote by uh, x0, and it's in this space of possible configurations which I'll denote by x, and so the idea is that we start off from initial condition and then at various times in the future, I'll take discrete times rather than continuous because it's just simpler for the beginning. And so the positions and the velocities of all the particles are given by these single values at time n, which is just related, just represented by um, uh, xn. So it's just a general sort of setup. 
And in, in classical ergodic theory, one tries to generalize this to a much more sort of abstract setting. So in this case, you might have uh, some particular set called X and uh, there'd be associated to that a, a measure, which might be called a probability measure, if it is a probability measure. And generally you're interested in measures which are preserved by the uh, transformation. So we have now, as we did before, but now in a more general setup, a space X, a map or a transformation uh, T, and some measure hanging around, which allows us to describe typicality of uh, points. And so the basic idea is that we start off with the point X zero, just a point in the space, and then we apply the transformation to get a sequence of points by iteratively just applying T, the transformation. And it just moves points around in the, in the space to give us an infinite sequence or orbit. Okay, so this is kind of general. So here is a, a rather large circle, which is meant to represent the boundary of a disk, which is just my space X. Here's a point X zero. So an orbit is just a sequence of points in the space where we apply the transformation to get the next point in the, in the sequence. In this case, five, because that's as many as I drew in the picture. But in, in general, you just take an infinite sequence of points Given x0, it generates this orbit going off into the, into the future. And one of the questions is, well, whereabouts do these orbits actually go to? So I start with any typical point x0, and I look at this sequence of points in the space, the orbit. And the question is, well, how much time does it spend in some particular subregion of the space? And this brings you to the notion of the um, ergodic theorem. So, the characterization of the of ergodicity would be that if you take a typical point with respect to your measure and you look at the orbit, then what proportion of the orbit has the property that it lies inside some nice set, uh, which I've denoted by B. And the hope is that if you have ergodicity, then the proportion of time that your orbit spends inside this set B will in fact be proportional to the size of B with respect to the measure that's hanging around. And so this is <clears throat> uh, formulated sometimes as the book of ergodic theorem, assuming we have this notion of ergodicity. It's equivalent to say that uh, if you take uh, all the sequence of points, then for a typical starting uh, point x0, the sequence at xn, which is generated, well, the proportion up to some long time n, which lie inside this set b, is proportional to the measure B. And this is a picture of the great uh, David Burkhoff, father of uh, Garrett Burkhoff, the algebra guy. And so ergodicity in this notion is just saying that the amount of time that an orbit spends in the evolution of the system uh, in a certain set B is proportional to the size of the set B. Easy notion. Um, so you can also characterize this not just in terms of the amount of time that a point an orbit spends in time inside a set, uh, a given set B, but also you can formulate it in terms of functions because it's sometimes easier to do that. So the definition I just gave was that we say that this uh, transformation and measure are ergodic if for a typical orbit, the amount of time that the orbit spends inside the set B out, uh, up to a certain longer time N, and then N tends to infinity to give a proportion, then this should be proportional to the size uh, of the set B, what we're looking at. So this is a notion of ergodic averages. And for functions, you just say, well, instead of taking a set B, we take some function. Maybe it lives in, an, in, in, in the neighborhood of the set uh, B. We just have a function F. And then the idea is that we say the same sort of stuff. We start off with a typical point X zero. And instead of taking the proportion of time that you live inside B, you just sum up the values of the function uh, F along the orbit. So if the, if the function is equal to zero somewhere over here, it doesn't contribute. But in this region um, where the function seems to have some support, then it will contribute to the value. And it's easy to see that these two definitions are the same uh, just by choosing a suitable function F. So ergodicity here is just about the averaging along orbits uh, to get the right value, providing you start with a typical value with respect to the original measure. So it's a fairly uh, dry uh, definition, but it's a classical kind of approach. And um, let me 
just give some very trivial examples of uh, transformations. So the easiest one known to man is uh, the doubling map. So in this case, instead of um, six times 10 to the 26 dimensions, I'm just gonna take one dimension. And so the space X here is just the unit interval from zero to one. And the transformation is you just take any number you like, uh, you double it, and if it's bigger than one, you subtract uh, one. So it's just called a doubling map. This is a graph of it. And so for every point xn, you just get a new point xn plus one, and it generates an infinite sequence from any initial point uh, x zero, very easy. And the natural measure here is simply the usual Lebesgue measure on the unit interval zero one. So this is a very uh, simple, in fact, almost trivial example. Um, an almost equally easy example, but not quite so trivial, um, is the following. So this map is the uh, Lanford map, uh, named after the great mathematical physicist, uh, Oscar Lanford III, although perhaps this wasn't his greatest contribution to, to science. Uh, here you take um, a similar map where you take a point X and you double it, but this time around you also add on this, uh, this polynomial term. And the effect of this is that when you plot the graph of it, you get a slightly more curved effect. So this is a plot, apparently, uh, of this particular function here. And again, you could play the same game. You take a typical point and you apply the transformation to get an orbit. And then you ask, where does the orbit go? And then what happens is that the or for a typical orbit, the amount of time that it spends in any particular interval is going to be proportional to the size of the interval but not with respect to the Lebesgue measure, which was a measure for the previous example, but with respect to some measure which is equivalent to uh, Lebesgue measure. So there's some density which creeps in in order to be uh, invariant. So these are two very simple examples of uh, dynamical systems uh, which have uh, an ergodic measure and for which the averages of the orbits will behave in a way that you, you anticipate they would do. That is the ergodic uh, hypothesis is, uh, is true. Question from, uh, from Roger. Um, are these chaotic maps and are they similar to the tent map? They, they, they are chaotic and they are similar to the tent map. If they were the tent map, then probably they'd look like a tent. Whereas in this case, uh, for example, for the uh, doubling map, uh, both branches go in this direction, if you can see the pictures anyway. So the, the idea is yes, they're, they're, they're even simpler than the tent map in some respects. Okay. So, so these are just very simple one-dimensional maps to, to illustrate uh, these transformations and some measures that hang around. So in the title, I also mentioned mixing. So mixing is a slightly stronger property than, than ergodicity. And the easiest way to explain it is to go back to the definition of, of ergodicity, which use functions. So in this particular case, I want to now take two functions, say f and g, on my space X, might have been an interval, might be something more general. And then uh, we associate a, a correlation function or maybe an autocorrelation function if F was equal to G, um, which is just the following. So um, we integrate uh, the product of the two functions F and G according to the point and where you get to after n iterates of a transformation, maybe N, yeah and you take away uh, the product of the two integrals. So it's measuring how these two things are related. And so this is a correlation function. So for every value of n, I get a, a number here, a real number, and it comes about just by shifting one of the functions by the transformation n times and multiplying it by the other function. It's a correlation function. And then the notion of, of mixing, which is somewhat confusingly called strong mixing in pure ergodic theory, um, is uh, the following, that if you take any two uh, functions f and g, which are reasonable, so let's assume that they're smooth in this picture, um, then what happens is that this quantity, the, the correlation function should tend to zero as, as time evolves, as n goes to infinity. So it's just a, a notion. So the, intuitively, you're, you're introducing n as applying the transformation a bunch of times to move around uh, the points to be seen by f. And for each n, you get a number. And the hope is that when you uh, plot this thing, it's going to tend to zero as n tends to infinity. That's the, the notion of 
um, mixing. And it kind of measures how this, this system uh, in general kind of settles down to some sort of uh, equilibrium behavior in some vague sort of descriptive way. Okay, so that's just a, a stronger notion than, than ergodicity. If it's mixing, it implies ergodicity. Um, so a natural question to ask is, well, if you have this property of mixing with these sequences tending to, to zero, how fast does the sequence tend to zero? And one particularly convenient way, uh, a particularly useful uh, property is if it tends to zero exponentially fast. Uh, so in particular, if you choose any two functions to test the, uh, the, the property, f and g on the space. So in the two examples I looked at before, the doubling map and the Lanford map, but it would also extend to the tent map. Um, then you could ask, well, do these correlation functions tend to zero exponentially fast? That means that there's some value lambda between zero and one, so that you can bound how fast this tends to zero by a constant times a lambda to the n, exponential convergence to, to zero. Uh, exponential decay of correlations. Okay, and in the case of a doubling map, uh, the mysterious value of, of lambda is, is not so mysterious, equal to half. So there it would go down like one half to the n times a constant. But in fact, you can do even better than that because the doubling map is kind of easy. So in particular, you can show that these correlation functions actually have an expansion. So not only do you go down like um, one half to the uh, power n, but also these kind of other terms that appear, like harmonics of some kind, uh, which go down. So um, the difference between the, the principal term, the C of n, and this, this, this bound in this case, you could further bound by the other terms in this series. So there's a subtlety in this very simple example that you can see. And if you try it for the Lanford map, then in fact the same story is true, except the numbers are a bit more mysterious. So the Manford map was a slight perturbation of this uh, uh, doubling map. And what happens in that case is it's still ergodic and it's still mixing. And it also has exponential mixing. So these, co these also correlation functions go down exponentially fast and they go down like lambda to the n again, where lambda is going to be smaller than one. And furthermore, we get this kind of subtle um, sort of expansion where in fact you can write it as a series where you get these extra kinds of ripples that appear uh, in how C of n tends to zero. But whereas in the case of a doubling map, we're in, we're in good shape, we can actually just explicitly compute everything. And, they, the, and the values of lambda, lambda one, lambda two in this example would just be a half, a quarter, an eighth. In the case of this uh, perturbation, the Lanford map, then in fact, we don't actually know what they are. There's no explicit formula for them. And you actually just have to compute them. And so you can do that if you feel uh, like doing it. And sometimes these numbers are called uh, resonances. And you can explicitly compute them in some examples, for example, these chaotic one dimensional maps. And so here is a, a computation of the first uh, nine values uh, that you get uh, in the case of a Lanford map. So recall that in the case of the doubling map, it was just a half, a quarter, uh, an eighth, et cetera. Here, these numbers are not too different from those values, but they are just long, complicated uh, real numbers. But they do tell you how this particular example settles down, that is how the autocorrelation function actually converges to uh, zero. So that's uh, what happens in the case of discrete maps, and in particular, these one-dimensional maps where the chaotic behavior has a property that the autocorrelation function tends to zero in a kind of well-controlled and uh, easy to understand uh, kind of example. Um, so one of the downsides to looking at uh, discrete maps uh, is that they're not always that realistic. And this slide will not get much more realistic, but at least uh, I should say something about flows. So if you have a, a continuous system, for example, you have solutions to some sort of equations, then you can formulate the same notions of, of, of ergodicity and uh, mixing. And what sorts of systems would you want to look at? Well, you'd want the phase space to be uh, compact or bounded. You want this flow to be kind of chaotic in some reasonable sense. 
So the usual word to use here is a NOS of, and you want there to be some reasonable measure that tells you about typical orbits. And uh, this might be the volume if it happens to be preserved. And if it's not, it might be some other glorious measure named after famous uh, mathematicians. But anyway, so the idea of the flow is that you have a, a flow acting on the, on the uh, space X, and then one wants to ask something about the K of correlations. And in this particular example, this particular case of these kind of chaotic flows, um, there are some classical results due to uh, Dolga Piat, Liverani, and as of two weeks ago, Suji and Zhang, which says that the same sort of phenomena happens. That is that the flow mixes exponentially fast as time goes by. And so if you wanted to write it in this case, it's completely analogous to what happens in the discrete case. That is, you choose two functions on the space, uh, you move one of them around by the flow, flowing for time t, multiply by the other function and take the average with respect to your favorite measure, in this case, maybe the volume, and you compare it with the product of the integrals, and this is the correlation function, and you want this guy to tend to zero exponentially fast. So in, in case of, um, in case of uh, flows, it's slightly easier to write it the following way, but it goes down like some constant e to the minus alpha of t, where alpha here is just some number bigger than zero, the rate at which it decays exponentially down to zero. So this statement is kind of analogous to the discrete case, but somehow it's, it's slightly harder to prove these results in this particular uh, case. Uh, so let me give, I haven't given a definition of uh, of uh, NOS of flows, therefore I should uh, give an example. So the natural example to give in this case, uh, in a slightly sycophantic reference to, to Robert in this case, uh, is because uh, one can look at these things called triple linkages. Um, these were introduced by Thurston, who's got an R missing in his name, uh, and Weeks, and uh, the dynamics was studied by uh, Robert and uh, by Hunt. And so it's a very simple mechanical system uh, which consists of three masses whose, conjecture, whose trajectories are in a plane uh, and their actual positions and, and trajectories are constrained by uh, three rods. And one of my hobbies at weekends is to construct examples of these things uh, using drinking straws, water bottles, and gaffer tape. Uh, and so I did actually do this. And here, if you can see it, is an example of a triple linkage. You see that it's got uh, six uh, rods and it's got three weights. The weights are these silver guys. I'll do it, I'll run it again. Uh, the weights are these guys, and it's constrained at these three points, which happen to be water bottles. Um, and the white lines that you see, the rods are actually drinking straws. Um, and the behavior looks supposed to look a little, little chaotic because it's modeling a chaotic flow. It's actually an anosyl flow. At least it would be if the dynamics, of, if the dimensions of the straws were slightly more accurate in this case. Anyway, so this is an example of a chaotic flow and an oscillatory flow. And in the case of discrete systems, we had this kind of um, notion of resonance that told us how the correlation functions behaved. So what happens in the case of flows is it's not quite so transparent. Uh, the, the function, the correlation function is a function of t. It doesn't necessarily go down in a nice way where you can actually see the asymptotics. And the way to actually see the, the resonances in that case is to look at the Fourier transform of the function C of t. So here's, a, 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 here's the Fourier transform. So C of t is the thing I defined before, the correlation function. I take the, the Fourier transform of this in the usual way. So now it gives me another function, but of um, a different variable, which is z. And then if if you are lucky, as you are in the case of these uh, Anosov uh, chaotic systems, this uh, function on the real line extends into the complex plane. And in fact, the, the, the Fourier transform extends to the entire complex plane. And in this particular case, uh, what happens is that the poles, the, the singularities that you see for the extension, so the, the, the Fourier transform is actually defined on the real line. It extends as a function into the complex plane plane and the poles that you see dotted around here, not accurately driven, they're just a sort of representation. Uh, these are the resonances that you'd see. They determine properties of the function C of T. And in particular, 
uh, the, if the poles don't accumulate on this line for the complex function, then that's what gives you exponential decay of correlations. That's what makes it mix at an exponential speed. So in the case of flows, you can read information off, but the resonances themselves are actually just the poles of the Fourier transform of the correlation function, which is telling you how fast the system kind of mixes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, any more questions? What's meromorphic mean? Meromorphic. Um, it means that the function has an analytic extension to the entire complex plane, but it can have singularities. So an analytic extension would just be one where you didn't have any singularities at all. It would just extend everywhere. But the, in this case, there are singularities and the singularities are, are the poles. So in terms of that little um, model you constructed with the drinking straws. Yes. You just give us the analog of the singularities. What, what does that imply in terms of the way those things are moving around? OK, so, so when you uh, look at the singularities, then what happens is that, of course, if, they, if, if there's a band, this is a hand gesture, if there's a band along the real axis, as I said, the width of the band will determine how fast it stabilizes into some behavior. So um, it, it means uh, how, how quickly it becomes kind of evenly distributed in some sort of equilibrium. It's a bit hard to explain really, but it's kind of how, how easily it settles down to some sort of standard statistical behavior. And, and I don't know if you've thought about this, but you could make a lot of money in an executive toy by producing that thing commercially. Well, I think, I think Robert's great. got the copyright on it. I simply, I just make, make them for my own amusement. Who has the copyright? Uh, Robert, I think, Robert Mackay. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. We didn't, uh, we don't have a patent, but I did approach the University of Warwick's um, Arts uh, Center shop to ask if, uh, They'd like to commission someone to make a fifty-pound version or something, and it didn't get taken up. So, <laughs> but it's definitely a good idea, Roger. You're spot on there. I get that. I get that patent quickly if I were you. There's over a hundred people watching this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, any any further comments or questions? Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. Um, since, um, after all, this is half organized by rebuilding macroeconomics, um, what bothers me all the time here, whenever we're talking about ergodicity, uh, is the uh, fact that we're always reverting to something which in some sense is converging. And, you know, when you're thinking about the economic system as a whole, you have a horrid feeling that it's actually blowing up all the time, that it's not converging in any nice settling down sense to any stationary distribution or whatever. So I'd just like your reaction to that, because you give us, first of all, you start up with a, um, in the second talk with a beautiful example of many things. And then you say, well, actually, we're going to look at a thing on the unit interval and then mm -hmm. do all clever things on the unit interval. But in some sense, when you think of the sort of system that economists should be thinking about, you would think it's not a system which in some sense is, to use your own term, settling down. Um, or as an economist would say, stable. So I'd just like your reaction to that. Yeah, so I mean, when I say it settles down, I don't mean that it, it settles down to say a, a, a trivial sort of dynamics. I mean, the system is still very chaotic. Mm -hmm. uh, what it means is that um, if, for example, if you, if you wanted to um, take a typical orbit, it's a question of how long the typical orbit takes to, a, to approach um, the 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 um, average that you're expecting. So back in the original stuff I was talking about of the Boltzmann and the Goddick hypothesis, I mean there I didn't say anything about how fast it converges, how long you have to wait until the average is uh, flattened down, and uh, that can also be determined by these so-called resonances. If I could just throw in a line there, I mean one of the things I think at the it differs in terms of social systems of the kind that Alan is thinking about, is that it's not even typically possible in economic systems to know what the compact set is that these things live in. And, and that set itself is, is changing through time. Um, so that's half of the problem. The other problem, much more limited, 
is 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 uh, related to what came out in the first talk, which is very 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 long time uh, times to actually acquire any kind of uh, ergodic property or mixing property. Yeah, if I can uh, just uh, take one step further, Samuelson once said, um, you know, we need the ergodic hypothesis as he formulated it, because without the ergodic hypothesis, uh, economics would just become history. You can't have, there's no science anymore. So that's maybe a strong statement, but you, you, you begin to see, I think, this divergence between what Roger just said, a sort of social system, which is wind, winding its way through a space which is changing also. And then the ergodic hypothesis, which really restricts you quite a lot. It says, you know, at least this system has some sort of structure in its uh, probability in the, over the long term. And, you know, every now and then when you look at the economy as it is, you begin to wonder if there is much structure over, over time, which, is, which remains, as it were. Yeah, if I, if I could just respond very quickly. I mean, I, I think the, the hope that we have in social systems is that at least for some reasonable length of time, that set, compact set X, is not changing too quickly. Uh, and we can hope to learn something, uh, even if we're never actually settling down to something. I, I don't know what anyone else thinks about that. Before. Perhaps I could make a comment in this direction. So one of the things about economic systems is that the system is uh, time inhomogeneous or non-autonomous or other words like this, right? The external environment, if you like, is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the sort of things that um, both Juan and Mark have been talking about are the system are uh, the equations governing the system are the same for all time. Uh, so that's one direction for extension, and it is actually possible. I mean, this was addressed by Kolmogov a long time ago, um, and uh, Manuela Bujuranu, who's uh, listening here, and I have uh, written some things about this too. So one can talk about mixing in time and homogeneous systems too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Actually, I'm uh, just thinking, at, right at the current moment, the system is not looking quite as um, uh, settling down <laughs> as it were. So, but you may say, well, this is just a little bleep. Let's hope it is just a little bleep. <laughs> yes, indeed. <clears throat> okay, so were there any further questions? Um, well, let's just, I guess we can thank Mark. Thanks very much. Well, and um, go for the final talk of this session, which is uh, Tessie Tatarisa New, who's in the Department of Statistics at Boy, who's going to talk about ergodicity for stochastic processes and applications to statistics. Thank you. Let me. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really interesting to see all, all kinds of different viewpoints um, on, on this. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly grateful for this opportunity because it's the first time I really think about mathematics after two months of trying to get our students to graduate. Um, so this is this is really good. Um, so I'll come from the statistics point of view on an applied probability and try to say how I have been using ergodicity during the during um, my career. So I'll, I'll I'll start with the basics. So that's very much a uh, one slide of um, of um, um, summarizing a few of the slides that uh, Mark just showed. So we have a a map um, um, on a space, and um, we uh, and the measure. So we will say that um, this map is is um, uh, ergodic with respect to uh, measure new. If for uh, if the only invariant sets have measure zero or one. And a very important consequence of that is uh, Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, which says basically that um, averages in time converge to averages in space with respect to that measure. 
Now, if you ask one of our students what they know about um, ergodicity, the first thing that they will, will come to their mind is uh, Markov processes. Um, so quickly, I assume probably everybody is familiar with uh, Markov processes, but let me just quickly remind you. Uh, so what's a Markov process? So um, at time t, if you condition at everything up to time s, then the only thing that matters is where you add at time s. So um, uh, the distribution of t, given the whole path up to time s, only depends on where you are at time s. So that's the definition of um, um, uh, Markov process. And because of that, uh, in order to characterize the distribution, uh, you only need to know the initial distribution of the Markov process, or I call it new naught, and the transition probability kernel. Now, I've written the transition probability kernel in general. So it's the distribution, um, the, the probability of going from x at time s to t. Uh, the, to, to, to T. Uh, this is not homogeneous, but in practice, as and that's relevant to the discussion we just heard, in practice, we do assume most of the time that we do have a homogeneous Markov chain. So this uh, kernel only depends on the uh, time between um, evolutions on T minus S. So, uh, for Markov processes, usually the way you, 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 you see the definition of an ergodic Markov process is to say, well, um, if you wait long enough, wherever you start, eventually you are going to converge to the um, limiting distribution, invariant distribution nu. So it's this sort of uh, result. So the, you start at point x, after time t, the distribution of xt is going to be very close to this distribution nu. Now, the, it takes uh, different types of, um, um, there are different types of um, ergodicity. Um, you can have the supremum there, so you have uniform ergodicity. Um, you can have exponentials, so all kinds of ways of controlling the, um, the convergence rate um, to the limiting distribution. And that's very much the idea of forgetting initial conditions that um, we saw in the first talk. Um, so uh, there, are, uh, there is a vast literature of when an ergodic, a, a Markov chain is ergodic. So that's the, the, the definition, but um, giving conditions on transition a kernel, if it's actually a stochastic differential equation, you have uh, conditions on drift and variance. So there are all kinds of um, um, equivalent um, ways of defining ergodicity de depending on the actual Markov chain. Um, uh, but the, the, the fundamental idea is that it's somehow aperiodic and there are some sort of mixing conditions. And so how does this relate to the original idea of, of, of ergodicity in dynamical system? So basically the, the, the aperiodic and mixing conditions are very closely related to the shift of an operator being an ergodic map. Um, so what you, if you are mixing enough, then the probability, then, then um, you won't be able to find, uh, the idea is that you won't be able to find a set such that uh, that's invariant, uh, that's anything less than basically the whole space. Um, so it's something with probability one. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, under these mixing conditions that, um, well, as I said, are very related to the shift operator being an ergodic map, you get the um, ergodic theorem, which says again that time averages converge to space averages, or if you come from a um, probability point of view, this is very much like a generalization of the law of large numbers. And this is another way of of, of seeing, seeing this. All right, so uh, that's the background. So I'm mainly focusing on, on, uh, on um, Markov processes or stochastic dynamical system. And I want to look at two applications. The first is uh, stochastic filtering, and in particular, the problem of asymptotic stability in that context. 
and um, how, how um, ergodicity plays a role. And the second application is in the statistical inference for stochastic differential equations. These are um, rather arbitrary choices of applications. The, the ergodicity um, has a vast number of applications. It's, it's everywhere in, in um, statistics and applied probability. Um, these are just chosen based on, on, on my experience. And it, it's also, I mean, the way ergodicity comes in, uh, there are cases where we actually want to prove some sort of er ergodic result, for example, um, which is very much has to do with forgetting initial conditions. So in other words, it's a, it's a robustness result. Um, whatever you start with, if you don't know what you start with, it's okay. You'll correct yourself. Um, and sometimes it's just taking advantage of um, ergodicity um, to learn about the distribution by looking at time averages of um, uh, data, that's realization of, of, of some pro process. Okay, so uh, first application, stochastic filtering. So what's stochastic filtering? You, you have a Markov chain, Xn. The Markov chain is not directly observed. What you observe is some noisy function of that Markov chain. So um, in this case, it's additive noise, so a function of Xn plus some noise. And what you want to do is make inference about Xn given observations y1 up to yn. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm um, stating it in, in discrete time, but of course it can be generalized in continuous time as well. Um, this uh, first came up in tracking objects. It's very much, it's, it's signal processing, it's in tracking. Um, you have something moving in the case of tracking Xn. Um, you only observe some noisy um, 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 data, that's its position. You have some sort of dynamics of its movement. And based on your observations, you want to correct or even predict in the next step where um, your, um, your object is going to be. Um, and it turns out, and it's, it's, it's an old result, that the best guess you can have for um, Xn, given all this information, is the conditional expectation of Xn given all the observations up to time n, or the y's. Or more generally, what you want to um, look at is the condition distribution. And that's called optimal filter. It's optimal in, in an L2 sense. Um, so the, there are several challenges with that. Um, the first is all the misspecifications. Um, quite often, you don't know the initial conditions. For example, in the tracking problem, uh, you suddenly see an object. Uh, the, the first observation is already noisy. You don't know the truth where uh, the object started. So you don't know x naught, or you don't have an accurate initial distribution for x naught. Um, the other problem is um, misspecified transition kernel. So you don't always know the um, dynamics of, um, the, the, of your object, Xn. Um, and finally, uh, the, the last challenge in, in Sohasi building has to actually, how to actually compute the optimal filter. Um, Can I throw a question in, Tosi? Yes, yes. So, uh, the optimal filtering problem is said in an L2 sense. So if you had a loss function that was asymmetric, uh, or you were worried about uh, fat tails, for example, would that, you know, would that mean that you'd want the, 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 the solution to the filtering problem would be different? Um, the, the fat tails, I mean, that's, um, the, the dynamics of X shouldn't really, change anything, your cost function would. And yes, the solution then would be different. Okay. Um, yes. Um, so in this case, we take L2 because it's nice. It yeah. gives you this um, um, conditional distribution. And then you have all kinds of uh, nice properties. You have um, um, in the continuous case of stochastic PD, the SPD, the SPD that um, um, are satisfied by the um, condition distribution. Um, in the very simple case of um, 
linear systems with Gaussian noise, you have Kalman filter, so yeah. everything is nice. Um, now, what do you do um, with, um, if you don't know the initial conditions, well, the best you can do is hope that um, you choose some initial conditions and the system will be robust enough um, so that um, it corrects itself. Um, what do you do about um, misspecified transition when you don't know the dynamics? Um, you can try to estimate them um, at the same time as um, uh, solving this, the filtering problem. And I'll, I'll discuss this in a bit more detail. One of the ideas is just to make the parameter uh, part of your um, evolution. And now how do you compute the optimal filter in general? That's a, it's a big topic um, and it's all, it's, it's, there are many ideas approximate mainly. Um, there is a big area, the sequential Monte Carlo that, that tries to um, come up with good Monte Carlo type of uh, algorithms that converge to that uh, conditional distribution. So I'm, because it's, it's the closest thing here to ergodicity, I'm going to focus in particular to, on uh, asymptotic stability. So when we say asymptotic stability, we want to have a result like that. So for any nice function f, you want the conditional distribution. Uh, assuming that the condition distribution is, uh, the, initial, the, 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 the true initial conditions are new, you want the condition distribution of starting with any new and those uh, for starting with the true initial conditions new to eventually uh, go to zero. And it turns out, and that's a relatively old result, that um, this is true under strong mixing conditions on the, on the Markov chain. Um, so the other case I'm going to look at, and actually that's a, that's a null result uh, from my PhD days. Um, so I was looking at the case where um, you have unknown parameters and the idea was exactly to make the parameter part of the system. And then what you have is that the kernel now, so to go from uh, Xn to Xn plus one, now you have Xn and a theta, theta n, because you don't know the theta exactly, it's a, it's a candidate for theta, and you move to uh, Xn plus one, theta n plus one, and your ter kernel becomes, well, if you know theta, um, you move X according to K theta, and uh, that's a mistake, that should have been a theta as well. So, and then you, you, you keep theta the same, the parameter the same. Um, so that, if you look at it like that, this becomes um, now a, a Markov chain that's definitely um, not ergodic anymore. Uh, so can you still hope to have some sort of asymptotic ability and uh, with respect to some initial conditions? And the important part here is the initial conditions on the parameter. So you put a prior in the parameter and um, you look at the posteriors. Um, it turns out that under central conditions, you can still hope uh, it's still, well, not hope, it's a theorem. Uh, you will converge, you, we, you will have this sort of uh, asymptotic um, um, uh, stability, assuming a few things. So assuming that for each theta, you do have a uh, mixing conditions for K theta, you have to have in these, uh, so your prior on the parameter has to have sufficient, uh, enough mass around the true value of the parameter. Um, so that um, uh, you can capture it. And also you need this sort of identifiability condition. So you need to be able to um, see whether, um, to, to distinguish between different parameters. So two different parameters, alpha and beta, will have to result to different distributions, not for your X, but for your Y, because you, you, all your information comes through Y. And it turned out, and that was the uh, paper, um, a couple of years later by Ramon van Handel, who's, who's now in Princeton, that um, this idea of identifiability is really important. And um, as long as um, you have different distributions for Y for any two different uh, initial distributions, then your optimal filter will be asymptotically stable. So again, this is, I mean, this is heavily used over godicity, 
and um, um, rates of convergence to invariant measure. And what you want from ergodicity of your Barkov chain XN, what you want to prove is some sort of ergodic result for the optimal filter in the sense of forgetting initial conditions. So now I'll move to, to the um, second uh, uh, application I want to talk about. That's, that's more what have been in, uh, in the interesting me uh, these days. Um, so it's not just a Markov chain, it's a very specific Markov chain, is stochastic differential equation. And um, a big problem is um, how to actually estimate uh, parameters in, in the drift of variance of, of, of the SDE. How do you make inference? Um, I would say the, the main two um, methods for um, making inference for theta uh, would be maximum likelihood and uh, the generalized method of moments. Now, for maximum likelihood, um, the challenge in there would be how to actually construct it especially if um, one only observes um, discrete, um, uh, the, the solution discreetly, one path discreetly, and the other would be what are the properties of, of um, um, the estimators you get, the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, generalized method of moment that fundamentally uses the idea of, of the ergodic theorem. So in general, in most of the time, um, data comes as a time series. And you want to connect this time series with um, distribution that, that contains information about theta. So by using the ergodic theorem, you can take these time averages and um, uh, relate them to the, um, assume they're close enough to the uh, space averages, which uh, depend on theta, and use this um, to to estimate your parameters. So for the maximum likelihood method, uh, I'm not going to go into details, uh, but uh, you can construct the likelihood. I I'm assuming here that um, everything is um, observed uh, continuously. And um, the fundamental idea of um, constructing the likelihood is to use an appropriate change of measure. So there is nothing about ergodicity here. But um, what you are seeing is this sort of um, time averages. And um, it does turn out that if you do want to, um, if, if you want, if, in order to get um, um, estimators that will actually converge to the, to the right value that are consistent, asymptotically consistent, then you do need um, strong ergodicity assumptions on, uh, on your um, Markov chain, the SDE uh, in this case, and uh, ergodicity assumptions are usually um, expressed in terms of um, um, properties for the drift and the variance. And finally, um, for the method of moments, um, so again, as I said, this is taking advantage now of the ergodic theorem and the idea is to take these time averages and um, find the parameter that will get them as close to the space average um, as possible. And of course, the, the, this, is, this is extremely um, um, general. As, as, as long as you have ergodicity, this always works. And it even works um, in theory for, for um, not just STEs, but other processes, as long as they are ergodic. Uh, the challenge, of course, there is to actually come up with a nice uh, formula for the for the expectation. So, uh, just to conclude, sorry, could you go back to the previous uh, yes. slide? Um, so, Roger asked, "What's the left-hand side?" Uh, oh, it's not left. It's the okay. It's the first term and the second term, right? <laughs> oh, so. Okay. Um, Yes, so this is the um, um, yes the expectations of the, the space average and the time average. But maybe the question is uh, that we, you want to minimize this distance. Yes, yes. So to conclude, 
So in stochastic processes, so at least as um, from where I come from, ergodicity usually um, um, expressed in terms of in the context of Markov processes, and um, some um, and then there is also a, a large um, 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 literature in uh, stochastic differential equations. Um, a, 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 a lot of work goes into actually finding nice conditions that um, um, imply ergodicity. So that's a big part of, of um, uh, the literature. And then it's about how you use um, these ergodic processes uh, to get some sort of robustness in the sense of forgetting um, initial conditions um, or uh, how to take advantage of them in order to make um, to, to learn about your system. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so it looks like Roger already has a question. So um, maybe Roger, you want to go ahead? Yeah, Tessie. So uh, you talked about the, the case when, you, when the system's observed continuously. Um, in economics, we always have discrete observations. Uh, and there's been quite a bit of work a long time ago on um, on trying to estimate systems that are underlying and continuous, but with discrete observations. And I wonder if you could say something about that problem. Yeah, th there is a lot of uh, ongoing work on that. Um, some nice work is, uh, is by my um, my um, uh, colleague, uh, Gareth Roberts. So what they're doing is they have this MCMC method for actually um, sampling in between observations. Um, so um, then you, the idea is to, to fill in the space with more data from the right distribution, and then you have more information to do inference. So there are and then another, um, uh, another solution is to actually look at all kinds of um, high level uh, uh, approximations of the transition kernel. So there are so these. If I, if I took an analog in the case of, of a common filter with the linear system, in, in the common filter, you, you, can, you can clearly have observations at different frequencies from the underlying dynamics of the system. So is there something similar that, that carries over to, um, to uh, this, this, the, the continuous case? So you have a continuous, imagine that the system was continuous but linear, and, and, and the observations were then um, discrete. Can you, can you really just apply similar concepts to the common filter with different uh, frequencies of observation? So common filter with a continuous Markov chain discreetly observed. Um, you, uh, there, there are two things. Um, either you look at the SPD and you 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 need some sort of approximation unless the system is very nice. Um, one is to look at this SPD and to do some sort of um, um, high level approximation there. Um, so it's all about uh, how you approximate the, the transition kernel. That or uh, not so much in the case of uh, field. I'm not sure that will work in filtering. In in in, in just inference for stochastic differential equations. The other way is is what uh, uh, Gareth Roberts is doing by just simulating more data from the right distribution. So with simulated method analysis. Uh, so uh, yes. So it's an MCMC uh, some important sampling algorithm that simulates more data. Um, in between observations, creating more observations in some sense from the right distribution, and that's really the key. Thanks. If I may uh, make a comment on, on that uh, question, a, a lot depends on what you suppose the measurement noise model is. If you're observing continuously, then you'd better suppose some non-trivial <coughs> correlation time for your measurement error. You can't imagine that you have uh, each observation, the measurement error, at different times being independent. And I don't think it's I don't think it's so hard to do. I've thought about um, not not uh, observing continuously, but observing at arbitrary time points, 
with a continuous time process. Okay. So I did have one question, Tersi, uh, which I um, put in the chat. Um, can you say something about the mixing rate of Monte Carlo Markov chains? Uh, hmm. No. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> it's a big subject. Yeah, um, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> Because there you have the freedom to design them you yes. see, in order to yes. explore a probability distribution, which might yes. be the theory from some inference, but you should design them. Well, the, the ideal is to design them in a way so that the Monte Carlo process mixes reasonably fast and then you can get good estimates with uh, not too much computation. Yes, uh, that's the idea and it's, 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 it's definitely not an easy one. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Let's see, um, so Carlo, it looked like there was a question from some from Laser McSorley. Um, can that be can that be unmuted or? Uh... Yeah. Hi. Okay. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. It was just a very. Um, basic uh, question. I, I was just trying to think how we could apply your model to economics and it was just a, a simple question in terms of um, you use the phrase incorrect initial conditions. I was just like what exactly do you mean by that and then for us economists how can we think about that in um, our models, for example, the ergodic model, we, you know, we can learn something about the future from the past, but economists, we're still debating, um, you know, what's optimal, you know, um, as well. So it was just in terms of the initial incorrect conditions, if you could say a bit more about that, that would be helpful. Um, sure. Um, so the idea is that, um, well, you want this asymptotic stability. And that if, if you have that, then um, in some sense, you don't need to worry about it too much. It, in some sense, in the long term, because eventually um, the system is going to forget the initial conditions. So as long as, uh, so that was a bit of something I, I, did, I, 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 I didn't say much about in the, in the context of stochastic filtering, but you do need to start with, um, initial conditions that somehow contain the true initial conditions. I mean, if you don't have them there, you'll never see, you know, we will never converge. So there is, even in, in the in the last uh, paper by, um, let me go up, uh, Ramon, Ramon Van Handel. So in order to have this asymptotic stability, uh, when the true measure is new, you need your new to be absolutely continuous with respect to new. So as long as you, you cover the whole space, then the, you have strong enough mixing, then uh, in theory, um, it won't matter what's, uh, what initial conditions you have, you start with. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, thank you. So are there any, any further questions? Okay, well, let's, let's thank Tessie, um, in the usual way. <laughs> And we can, um, I guess we uh, start again at, in 20 minutes at six o'clock. Yeah, so, so uh, it's, if people want to keep chatting, that, that, that's fine too. But I'm going to go take a tea break. Uh, everybody's in a different part of the world here. So uh, have tea, dinner, coffee, supper, <laughs> breakfast, wherever you are. Um, and we'll reconvene in, in 15, 20 minutes uh, for the second half of this. So thanks everybody um, so far, and uh, I'm off for a cup of tea. Okay, then I, I think we're ready to move um, into uh, part two. Um, and uh, we're moving into um, three talks that are a little more connected with social sciences as opposed to natural sciences. Well, two of them are, uh, and, and one, um, uh, back to mathematical sciences. So our first speaker is uh, Ollie Hume, 
from the Danish Research Centre for Magnetic Resonance and the London Mathematical Laboratory. So if you'd like to kick it off, um, Ollie. Sure. Uh, so here we go. And, and again, if I could say the rules are the same. Um, so if you have any questions, just put them into the chat function and they will be screened first, unfortunately, by Carla. She'll, she'll forward them on to me. Um, and I will either answer, uh, decide to interrupt the speaker, or hold them for later. So um, let's go. Okay. Great. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking from Copenhagen. Um, I'm going to talk about ergodicity and decision making. Uh, and it's an experiment that I did as part of a brain scanning project. Uh, although I'm not going to talk about the, the, the brain data per se, but I'll talk about the behavioral data. Um, so I'm going to just jump right in and, and start talking about dynamic, sorry, uh, gambles, but from a, a, a dynamical perspective. Uh, so this leans heavily on, on the work of Oli Peters and Alex Adamu, who I believe are here. So we're going to define um, uh, wealth at time t, uh, as just x brackets t, and we're going to um, think of a gamble. This particular gamble uh, is a very simple one. Um, we're going to toss a fair coin. If it lands heads, then your wealth is going to grow by five kroner. And if it lands tails, your wealth will shrink by four kroner. Um, so R brackets T is just defined, it's a random variable defining the growth increments by which your wealth would change under this uh, gamble. Uh, and this updates your wealth. So your wealth at the next time step is simply equal to your, your current wealth plus the whatever the random variable was at the time. So whatever the outcome of the, uh, of the gamble was, that just additively changes your, your wealth. So the gamble has additive dynamics. It's probably the most common uh, gamble uh, studied in the fields I'm familiar with, psychology, neuroscience, economics, and so forth. Um, and well, let's play the game uh, tossing once uh, per minute. So um, it's a very trivial game, as I'm sure you're aware. So we're just going to look at the ensemble average wealth of a million players playing this game. Um, so the sum and track their wealth as uh, time proceeds from zero to 60 minutes. Um, so there's some noise, but there's not that much noise because we're averaging over a million players. Uh, the purple line shows the expected value of the growth rate, which is trivial to calculate. That's just taking uh, the ensemble average and taking n up to infinity. So the expectation value of the growth rate is half a krona per minute. Um, so as expected, this is, a, this is an, a nice gamble to play. There's another way we can sort of um, look at this. We can take one player and follow them over a much longer period. So we now, instead of following them over now we follow them over um, several days so now we can calculate the uh, time average of the growth rate by taking the the the, uh, the, the time limit at infinity and again we're going to find that the uh, the growth rate is half a krona per minute um, so it's probably no surprise that the the changes in wealth of this game are ergodic uh, ergodic just uh, under the definition uh, that Ensemble, uh, ensemble averages are the same as time averages. Um, now, for an agent trying to think about what gamble to take, computing the expectation value of the growth rate is informative because it tells the, the agent how their wealth might evolve over time. So now we can look at a different dynamic. We can look at uh, multiplicative dynamics, same notation. Um, now the gamble uh, is going to be determined by growth factors. So um, heads, uh, your wealth grows by 50%, your total uh, lifetime wealth. Uh, tails, your wealth shrinks by 40%. Um, and then now your wealth will update um, now as a function of this dynamic. So um, the growth factor is then multiplied by your, your, your current wealth. So we just say that this gamble has multiplicative dynamics. Um, so these are just two dynamics. You can, you can have many different dynamics, but we're just going to focus on, on these two just to illustrate some key points. Uh, and that sort of uh, builds up nicely to the experiment. So let's play this game. Uh, and again, tossing uh, the coin once uh, uh, per minute. 
And this example, uh, this example, or all of these examples are, uh, are stolen from Ali Peters. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. So we're going to look at the ensemble average wealth of, of players uh, playing over, over the 60 minutes. We're going to start with uh, one player. So it's not really an ensemble average because it's just one player playing every minute for one hour. So there's a lot, a lot of noise, as you might expect. Let's do the same, but now we're going to take an ensemble average over 10 players playing the same game. Um, less noise, 1,000 players playing. And then we can take uh, the, the, the limit, uh, which would be an infinite number of players playing. And that basically, unsurprisingly, as, as n gets larger, for the ensemble, the fluctuations get smaller, and you hit the expectation value in the large ensemble limit. So, OK, so that looks like a good gamble to play, but you can't typically, unless you're a king or something, you can't typically access the average wealth of an ensemble of people. Um, and you, you typically only have access to your own trajectory through, through life. So let's look at how these wealth trajectories evolve for individuals. So let's take this just one player and track them for 60 minutes. Um, it's kind of noisy. Uh, let's track them for longer, uh, playing for a day. Track them for a year, playing once per minute for a year. And it looks like a pretty bad gamble, right? Maybe that person's just colossally unlucky. So let's just take 10 uh, randomly chosen people playing the same game uh, again over a day, again over a year. And it's looking like the, the typical wealth trajectory for randomly chosen players playing is pretty, pretty poor. So what's going on? So well, if you calculate the expectation value of this multiplicative uh, gamble, uh, then it has a, uh, a expectation value of its growth factor is above 1.5 so you're you're getting exponential growth which is why in the, the first instance we we were seeing that exponential rise of the expected uh, value of the of the wealth however if we switch to looking at the time average and we calculate the time average of the growth factor that's below one and that reflects more the the typical wealth trajectory of individuals playing the game so these two are not, not equal. Um, so th th this is the the this might not be uh, necessary for uh, an audience of mathematicians and uh, uh, physicists, but typically f this is the point where the audience uh, is totally confused, and they ask me, "Well, how can the ensemble average wealth increase while typical wealth decreases?" And one intuitive answer is that uh, well, it's an inequality producing game. So the lucky few in the ensemble grow so rich that this dominates the average. Most people are, are losing money, but there's a, there's a, a, a minority that are, grow so rich that this dominates the average to pull the ensemble average up. So because this, uh, the ensemble average is not equal to the time average, then the changes in wealth are non-ergodic by definition. And intuitively, well, if you're computing the expectation value uh, when considering whether to play the gamble, it's not particularly informative of how your wealth will change over time. So how, how would you decide whether or not to play each of these gambles? Uh, so one principle uh, you can think about is time optimality. So time optimality entails optimizing the time average growth rates of an observable you care about. We're going to just think about money, but you could you can apply it to any variable you, you care about optimizing over time. So maximizing the expected value uh, we found was time optimal under additive dynamics, but it was ruinous under multiplicative dynamics. If you'd have played that um, multiplicative uh, gamble, uh, your wealth would have plummeted eventually. So a good I hope this shows that this a good strategy for one dynamic can be a bad uh, strategy for another. So this opens the question, well, how can you make time optimal decisions under different dynamical settings? So w one approach, and I've just bastardized uh, the, the, the lecture notes of um, uh, Ole and uh, Alex, but basically they, they specify a time optimal algorithm for maximizing the time average uh, growth rate. So basically you need to specify the dynamic that you're facing. You then find the wealth transformation whose changes are ergodic under that dynamic. 
You then compute the expected value of those changes for the, trans for the transformed variable. And by virtue of the ergodicity, you recover the uh, time average. And then if you maximize that ex expected value, then you are uh, by definition maxima maximizing the time average growth rate as well. If I could just interrupt for a second, Ali. So we have a question from um, Matej who says, uh, Reading the ergodicity economics PDF, I always thought what actually uh, what actually are the other dynamics other than additive and multiplicative, and he's yeah. asking for real life examples. So they um, uh, in Alex and all they have a nice paper um, called the time interpretation of expected utility, where they consider um, a specific dynamic. Um, which would give you square root utility. Um, I'm not sure how to describe that in words, but maybe they could uh, interrupt. Um, so basically, I mean, you can you can write down any dynamic you want, um, and um, it, well, maybe maybe that maybe they could answer that one. Let's, let's hold that off to the end. Yeah, we can hold it off to the end. But there are there are other dynamics that you can you can specify that will will result in. Um, uh, different utility transformations, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because I haven't um, talked about utility. So um, there is an equivalent way of thinking about this, which is um, perhaps more natural to, to um, those that think about ec economics, which is basically you specify the dynamic and then you find a utility function whose changes are ergodic uh, for the particular dynamic. Um, and then you compute the expected value of the changes in utility and if it were, if it is the ergodicity transform, then uh, that naturally recovers the time average growth rate, and then you maximize that um, expected utility. Um, now the two are mathematically equivalent uh, in the sense that they would lead to the same behavior and they would lead to the same uh, uh, outcomes and trajectories. So let's just uh, flesh out what that would look like. So let's go back to our original additive dynamic. Uh, this, is, this is how wealth updates according to that additive gamble. Well, the, um, the utility or the transformation necessary to render it ergodic or ch the changes in that utility ergodic is just linear utility. So you don't really do anything to, to X um, because it already is an ergodic um, uh, observable. Then you compute the expected uh, change, uh, value of the changes in utility. Well, that's just the expectation value of the changes in, uh, in your wealth. And then you maximize expected utility. So here you're just maximizing the expected value. Um, so it's kind of trivial. Um, in, for the other dynamic, you, um, uh, the transformation that renders those changes ergodic is the logarithmic transform. Um, so then to maximize or to compute the expected value of changes in that utility, that would be the expected value of the changes in log of well, so the, just the log utility. And again, you maximize this expected utility. So this is interesting because it, it um, conflicts with um, existing theories in all sorts of interesting ways. As, uh, as an experimentalist, I'm interested in theoretical disagreements. Um, and the bigger, the better. And I, I've never seen a theoretical disagreement bigger than this. Um, so basically, I'm just going to group some, some major theories or types of utility together, uh, expected utility, prospect theory, and isoelastic utility. So is utility stable under these, uh, under these theories? Um, arguably, yes. Um, but it's distinctly not stable under time optimal utility because it changes every time the, the dynamic changes. Um, is utility idiosyncratic in the sense that can you have any utility function you want subject to the constraints of the theory? Uh, yes, for these theories, but for time optimal utility, no, you can't. It's, just, it's a very normative theory. It's literally, you can only um, obtain the utility function that's time optimal. Now, of course, that makes it sort of psychologically slightly implausible. Of course, people are different, but as a idealized model, it's a, it's a very clear starting point. Uh, is it calibrated to dynamics? Well, explicitly no uh, for, for these theories, explicitly yes for the time optimal theory. Can it maximize time average growth? Well, arguably no, if, if you present 
agents with different dynamics by virtue of the fact that it has to be stable, it's impossible for the agent to maximize time average growth rates uh, and precisely yes for the time optimal model. So there are other um, models I can talk about uh, that sort of com uh, complicate this, this picture, but uh, these are the principal models that we, that we compared in the, in the following. So the question is, which of these theories best account for risky decision-making under different dynamical settings? So we did a, an experiment to do this. It was in the brain scanner. Um, we endowed subjects with lots of money, a um, uh, thousand kron, and that's about 125, 130 quid. Uh, we let them learn the dynamical effects of different stimuli on their wealth. So they just, they observe these different stimuli and they, they each have a deterministic effect on their wealth. That's just for them to learn what those stimuli do. And then they make active decisions between gambles comprised of those stimuli. So I'll un unpack this in a moment. We then manipulate ergodicity uh, of the wealth changes by switching between additive and multiplicative dynamics in the way that I've already shown you. Um, and then we, we run some Bayesian methods to estimate uh, parameters of utility models and perform model comparison to see which of these theories can best predict the data. Uh, just a note to the physicists, um, uh, you seem to be vulnerable uh, to getting confused about fractals. Basically, the, the fractal is, it doesn't um, uh, mean anything. It, we could have easily chosen cats and dogs. Um, the, there's no inherent meaning to the actual fractal. Um, so learning the stimuli in the, in the passive phase. So basically, subjects can see their wealth uh, in the middle of the screen. Um, these, these numbers are just uh, timings of events, which are important for the neuroimaging. Um, so the time is progressing along here. This is a single trial. Uh, when the box comes on, you, you press a button, uh, a wheel spins. This is just to keep subjects awake. And then crucially, a, a fractal image will come on and it will deterministically affect your wealth. So every time you see this image, it will change your wealth in a deterministic way. And you'll see each of these many, many times and you'll see um, there's a total of nine different fractals to learn. So you're learning these for about an hour. Um, and subjects' wealth are going up and down um, at quite a scary uh, rate because it's quite a lot of money. So subjects learn via experience. That there's no explicit communication of what the fractals mean or what the dynamics are or anything. We just let them experience it. And then they have to decide um, between gambles uh, in the active phase. So basically, we... Uh, this is the presentation of the first gamble, so, so it's similar to our example. So maybe that, that top fractal would represent a gain of five krona if, if uh, the coin was, came up tails. And this fractal would represent a loss of four kronas if the coin, came, coin came up uh, heads. So every gamble is a fair coin gamble. Uh, so with 50% probability, you'll get this or this if you chose it. And they're all mixed gambles. So that's the first gamble. And then you're given a second gamble to choose uh, against. So you can either choose this gamble or this gamble, each comprised of two images. Um, and that's it. And you're doing this very, very rapidly. You're making a choice every, every 10 seconds. Um, and what we do is we repeat the experiment under different dynamics. So we have a multiplicative condition and a additive condition. So you can see that the, the extremes are pretty hairy. So uh, at one end, your wealth is shrinking uh, by more than 50%. At the other, it's doubling by more than 100%. Uh, in the additive condition, you're at the worst end, you're losing 50 quid. In, literally, in just one event, you'll lose 50 quid. In another event, you'll, you'll gain 50 quid and gradations in between. So what we're going to do is we use isoelastic to the can I just quickly ask a question about that? So is, yep. is there a bankruptcy constraint? No. So you can go negative? You can't, no, so you can't, um, so basically they're, they're filtered so that um, that wasn't possible. So we created bridges uh, in the in the total such that you, you couldn't, you couldn't lose, you could, you, could, you could end up with zero, but you couldn't end up with negative amounts. So you, the, the, does that mean that the gambles you're faced with change if you get very if you get very poor um you, no, so the, sorry, I should say the, the gamble the gambles are realized at the at the end so they're not aware of the 
they're not aware of the um, their current wealth or their current outcomes. So basically, if and, and then we, if the if the sampled well, so we we choose to realize ten of the wells. Um, if that results in a, an extreme amount of money or extreme uh, debt, then we then we uh, sample again, basically. So we, th the subjects know that they can't lose money and they can't win more than uh, about 220 quid. Are they allowed to decide how much to invest at each step? No, it's all in on everything. So it's 100% leverage. That we ha it's an interesting idea to allow them to to leverage as much as they want and then you could sort of look at uh, Kelly criteria and things like that. Shall I proceed? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. sorry. Um, so uh, we, 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 we estimate the parameters of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of risk aversion. So, we, so basically, so we use, uh, uh, we estimate the parameters of an isoelastic utility function. So this is a simple, uh, widely used uh, utility uh, function. It has one parameter, uh, the risk aversion parameter, eta. Um, so if eta is below zero, then subjects are uh, uh, risk-seeking. If it's um, above zero, then they are risk-averse. If it's zero, then they have linear utility, which could be described as risk-neutral. And uh, if it's equal to one, then they, they have logarithmic utility. So this is, this is an interesting utility function to calculate because it contains the time optimal solutions. So by freely fitting these parameters, uh, the time optimal model makes a prediction for what the parameter value should be under what condition. Um, so we, we estimate uh, this risk aversion parameter via hierarchical Bayes. So it's a Monte Carlo Markov chain uh, method. Um, it's, it's hierarchical, um, so you do partial pooling over, over subjects. We have a sensitivity parameter that determines how stochastic or um, just how stochastic the choices are. Another way to think of it is how sensitive the, their choices are to the differences in utility between the the two options. Um, and then the other parameter of interest is the risk aversion parameter, which I just described. So we're mainly interested in, in estimating uh, each individual subject's uh, risk aversion under the two different conditions and seeing how it changes. Um, so just to recall, so the time optimality model predicts risk aversion should shift from linear to log utility. So it should shift from uh, zero to one if the time optimality model is correct. And if dynamics have little effect, then the risk aversion parameters should be relatively stable. So this is uh, the risk aversion, this, the uh, posterior risk aversion parameters um, collapsed over all uh, subjects. Uh, in uh, blue, we have the additive condition. In red, we have the multiplicative. The dotted line is the uh, the prediction of linear utility for the time optimal model and the red dotted line is the uh, log utility prediction of the time optimal model. So you can see there is some substantial spread within the conditions, but the, but the modes of the distribution are surprisingly close to the, um, to the predictions of the time optimal model. So recall the time optimal model is not, it hasn't got any free parameters, it's just a, a specific prediction. Um, so, uh, and this, you can look at the single subjects and um, there is some degree of um, heterogeneity, but every single subject substantially shifts uh, from, um, from uh, or they, they all shift increasing their risk aversion. And there's a huge base factor for the, the hypothesis that they, they increase uh, their risk aversion. There's another way to look at this, which is basically just to look at it on a heat map. So if we have uh, risk aversion for the additive condition and risk aversion for the multiplicative condition, the time optimal model makes a specific prediction, which is that all agents should be at this intersection of linear and log utility. Obviously, there's going to there's going to be noise between subjects, so you you kind of qualitatively you assume a cluster around this uh, normative point. The, the other theories um, are 
don't make specific predictions about what the utility function will look like, but they do predict that they um, will be uh, relatively stable. So if they're stable, then they should be clustered along, along this diagonal. So in other words, you can have any utility function you want um, as, long as, um, as long as it's relatively stable. Uh, and this is the actual data. So sort of qualitatively, it, you know, it, it looks quite, quite like it's corroborating the time optimal model. More quantitatively, you can, like, you can look at the Euclidean distance of the, uh, the maximum a posteriori, a posteriori estimates and look at the, uh, how far they are, they are from each um, prediction. And in every case, for every subject, the time optimal model uh, is, has a closer prediction to the actual data. But this is just parameter estimation. Uh, we can actually do formal uh, model comparison uh, where we take into account different complexities of models or different uh, vaguenesses and so forth. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, called a hierarchical latent mixture model. It's one large model which contains kind of three sub models within it, a time optimal model, a prospect theory model, and an isoelastic model. Um, and basically we have a, a model indicator variable, which um, you can think of as the, it controls the degree of mixing of each of these that we need to best explain the data. So if, if prospect theory is the best model, then this, this variable will load uh, highly onto prospect theory. about wrapping up fairly soon, Ollie. Oh yeah, I'm almost there. So uh, the posterior probability of, um, of this can be interpreted as the, uh, the posterior probability of the model uh, given uh, agnostic uh, priors to begin with. Uh, we see strong evidence for the time optimal model over the other two models. And you can do things like the protected exceedance probability, which is the probability that uh, each model is the most frequent in the general population. And again, the time optimal model wins. So in summary, the parameter estimation and model comparison show pretty good predictive adequacy for the time optimal model um, compared to those we tested. Uh, we think it might be the first empirical demonstration of time optimal decision making and its dependence on dynamics. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so there's a question mark there. Um, we're sort of provoc to be provocative, I think um, we think it opens questions as to whether the most widely used theories of behavioral economics are adequate for explaining risky choice when ergodicity breaks. Um, obviously, this is just one experiment. Uh, it was only in uh, 19 subjects, 18 subjects. Uh, although it was highly powered within those 18. Um, we want to replicate this to see if we can replicate it. We want to generalize it over different paradigms. It's quite an unusual paradigm. Uh, it's not really often seen in economics. And we crucially, we want to test this over a wider range of dynamics uh, because uh, the, the theory makes very falsifiable predictions for a whole set of different dynamics. Uh, and more broadly, we think this uh, motivates a need for incorporating ergodistic constraints into theories of decision making and crucially, uh, you know, trying to falsify them. And just to advertise, uh, we're interested in adversarial collaborators and students. The students don't have to be adversarial, but the <laughs> collaborators are preferred to be um, for future projects. Uh, and these are the people that did the work. So these are the authors along here. Oops, sorry. Uh, and um, Finn and David did uh, a lot, most of the heavy lifting, thanks to uh, London Math Lab for a lot of help with their theories and a lot of support, and a lot of um, skepticism from people on Twitter who've been uh, remarkably uh, helpful in improving our uh, analyses. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ollie. Uh, well, I, I think we'll run a little bit over and have about five minutes of questions if, if people are interested. And I'm going to just roll off with the first one, which is yeah. that. So I'm still a little confused about um, the way that you, you thought about utility maximization. So um, as an economist thinking about this, my, the way I would, I, I would try and model it was that these 18 subjects coming in were trying to maximize uh, the, uh, some monotonic increasing function of the amount of money they walked out of the experiment with. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't think about anything they cared about in the way that they got there. Is is that what you set up and tested, or were you were you thinking about whether or not they cared about 
uh, anything along the way. So they, yeah, I mean, it's explicitly estimated on the trial by trial choices. Um, so that, that would count as how you get there. So I think you're, you're speaking to, a, to an issue that, that's quite often raised, which is um, the, um, yeah, you're, 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 you're taking whatever strategy is required to maximize the utility of your end wealth. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, so I, I, I would say I would expect people who were expected utility maximizers to use different strategies in the two situations. Yeah. Now, you still might be able to find differences in, in what came out at the end because yeah. somebody with logarithmic utility would be more risk averse over the final outcome than yeah. somebody with linear utility. But it's my right. understanding that, that, that somebody with, with um, with expected utility would be using the Kelly criterion to try to yeah so the, so the, so this is very much in line with um, some criticism from Adam Goldstein who's written a couple of blog posts about it and we're collaborating together to sort of try and resolve this um, so basically he 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 shows that um, or he, he claims to show that if if you have a particular utility function then when faced with these different dynamics, you will behave as if you had different utility functions within yeah. the game, even though you've got the same base utility function. That, that would be my claim. Yeah, okay. So firstly, um, it's, 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 there's two things. One is that it's biologically and computationally implausible to do the necessary calculations because the branching factors to simulate ahead uh, are just astronomical. Um, so the so because the gamble space is huge, and because you never you never are uh, have any of your gambles realised, um, the it, it just involves colossal computation in order to actually try to calculate the end wealth. Secondly, even if you were able to do that. Uh, it's not a very specific model because you, you're still unconstrained as to what your end utility function actually is. Um, so you can still have any utility function and then you've still got to calculate how many steps ahead they can calculate. But they, could, they it's, you can show it's, it's implausible even to calculate ahead by one trial. But to do it effectively, you've got to calculate ahead by 300 trials. Um, so it's it's not it's not really a plausible um model you can if you can't calculate ahead then basically um you you then have the same you you express the same utility function um as you as you have for your end wealth basically yeah and that's what and that's pretty much falsified by the data does that make sense um it makes i i understand the words but um, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have to read this more closely. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, but our, so if you, I, I can send you his uh, blog post, and then we reply to it in the latest version of the paper, which is just about to. Uh, we'll, we'll put the, the latest version on archive. Um, yeah, and you can you can make your own mind up. Yeah. Can I ask a, a quick question, which is, what precisely do the subjects know? as it's going along. So they're sitting there making these gambles. And yeah. then the process underlying, whether it's multiplicative or additive changes, you're changing that. So is this that they're just adapting to what's going on or do they know anything about uh, what the underlying changes are or, or how the process is working? So there's, there's no explicit information. Uh, so they don't, they don't even know that it's possible that the dynamics can change. So the, the experiments are done on separate days um, so within one testing session, the, the dynamics are constant. Um, so it's it's unknown how they how they arrive at this kind of approximation of the time optimal model. They either they some subjects might figure out that it's entirely multiplicative or entirely uh, additive just by you know calculating these things through. Uh, it's also possible that they just do it Im implicitly, but we don't. We sort of purposely didn't tell them anything, um, in order to in order to avoid uh, any interference with any sort of 
lay theory that they ha may have about these dynamics or about investments or about all sorts of things. If, so you if you can it. do this, it would, um, if you ever do this with a larger number or even with a number yeah. you've got, yeah, we're planning it. It's interesting to see, maybe you already published this, what the resulting wealth distribution is um, for the individuals at the end of the experiment. You only have 18 points. But yeah. But you don't allow yeah. for switches during one session. So in other words, my what's happening to me is going to be the same during that session. So the process underlying is not changed during that time. Because there no. were experiments by Cohen in, at Princeton in his lab, where he actually had the thing changing as you were going along. So mm -hmm. we really didn't know whether the, uh, what was happening, the underlying process itself was changing. Yeah. And perhaps that's more, well, on some scale, that might be more r realistic because dynamics do change as a function of your wealth, but they probably wouldn't change on the, on, yeah, on the, on the matter of minutes. But yeah, it's, 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 it's a wide open question how you would learn these things or learn different environments, learn the dynamics of different environments and how they switch is, yeah, it's kind of a fascinating question. Well, I, I'm doing quite a bad job with uh, with time management here. Um, we're running a little bit over, so um, I think we should say a big thank you to Oli Hume. Um, and, thank you. And, and move on to uh, JP Bouchot. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, very happy to talk to you about um, this subject of um, quasi non legacy and so my title is self trapping for and etc a glimpse into a quasi non ergodic world. And, and this is half a, a short uh, review, a mini review, um, but also a, a recall progress on several projects that I've been involved with uh, several people uh, who are listed here, in particular uh, Roger. So you've heard a lot about ergodicity, and so let me give you another example. Uh, which I find very striking in, in a way. It's a very classic example. So polya urns, they're just urns with N white balls and N black balls at the beginning, and you draw one of them at random, and um, at every draw, an extra ball is added, but with the same color as that of the last draw. So, so this is a kind of reinforcement. That the more you pick white balls, the more you're likely to pick white balls in the future. And in a sense, the surprising feature of this model is that the probability to draw a white ball converges at large times, tiles a sudden p infinity, which means that you still pick white balls and black balls with a sudden rate p infinity, but this probability p infinity is itself distributed. That is, if you had started another experiment with the same initial condition, you would have ended up with a different p infinity. So, you, you need probabilities of probabilities in, the, in this uh, example. And that's what I've called P curly. You need a curly P of P infinity, which tells you what is the probability to actually converge to a certain P infinity. And this is, in, the, in this example, it's, it's actually a beta distribution. So, so the process is clearly non ergodic If you take a time average on a given trajectory, it doesn't uh, coincide with the ensemble average, which would give uh, an average of a curly P. And so betting on the ensemble average of the infinity would be very bad on the long run because um, it, the, the probability of the process would converge to something else. And what's interesting about this ergodic with versus non ergodic dynamics, and this has been uh, alluded to by Juan P. Garahan earlier, is that it's a very generic property shared with many complex systems like classes or spin classes and physics. Um, there's actually more. Um, uh, concrete examples of this story of Poya arms, and one is what people call multi arm bandits. So you have several arms to play with, and each arm has a true average payoff uh, that I can call theta i star. But the players don't know about these payoffs and try to learn them. So they bet a certain quantity x i at time t on arm i. So, for example, zero on every arm except one, where they play one, and they get rewarded with the true payoff, but with some noise. There's some extra noise which prevents a, a, a clear observation of these uh, true payoffs. And so players attempt to learn these tested Peter stars through a uh, you know, very natural uh, rule, which would be uh, they do a rich regression of their payoffs in the past on their 
uh, actions, and they bet accordingly in the next time step as to maximize their expected gain at every time step. And what you find in this example is that you actually get trapped on an estimation of theta, which is not the true one. And what you see on the, on, on the little figures here are simulations where each uh, dot, green dot, is where you end up after a long time. And the star is the true value of theta star. So this is a case where there are two arms. And uh, there's a theta 1 and a theta 2, which is here. But you never learn it. And, and there's no way to get out of this uh, self-coherent set if you uh, continue playing uh, according to the same rules. And the mathematics is actually very similar to the poly arms. Uh, you can study what happens if you share information between agents. So several agents play this game simultaneously, and they share what they try to have learned. And what you find is that they, they're able, through sharing, to synchronize, but not to reach the true uh, theta sum. Another variant of this model is Alan Cummins, who's obviously here, uh, model, which is also known uh, in uh, genetic modeling as the Morin process. So now, after each row, an extra ball is added with the same color as that of the last row, but it replaces randomly chosen balls. So now the number of balls is constant. And in this case, what you find is that the probability to draw, to draw a white ball converges at large times either to one or to zero. But the ensemble average is, is still half if you start it with a, an equal mix of uh, white and, and black balls. In, um, in the population dynamics, this is called fixation. This is when a, a gene uh, overwhelms uh, the rest. You can generalize this model, as actually Alan did um, in his model, if you add small errors, that is, uh, if instead of uh, re re replacing the, the, the ball with the same color, you switch colors from time to time with a small error rate, epsilon, then the probability p does not converge to 1 or 0, but remains distributed. And what's interesting, and what Alan discussed a lot in his model, is that there are very long periods where p remains close to 1 and then switches to uh, p equals 0. So for a very, very long time, you have the impression that uh, the number of uh, the property to draw a white ball is close to 1, but then it's going to evolve and switch to uh, the other color, 0. So that's what um, one would like to call quasi non ergodic behavior. So it's close to non ergodicity which would be the case where epsilon is 0, but because of the small epsilon, you're, allowed, you're, you're able to untrap yourself and explore the full phase space, uh, as it were, and, and switch from one possibility to another, and, and actually probe the whole distribution, which in this model is, again, a beta distribution. OK, so now um, I'm going to switch to the work that we've, we're under uh, completion, which is under completion with uh, Roger, but I'm going to give you a small hint of what we're trying to do within the framework that I've just uh, talked about. So now, instead of having a white ball and a black ball, we imagine a world where, at each time step, there are uh, two possible events, say a good event and a bad event. And we assume that agents all have their subjective probability, PI, that the next event is, is a good event, say. And the twist we're going to introduce is that we imagine that the actual probability of this event is affected by what people think. So you know, this is a model where, for example, uh, when uh, football players have a strong confidence on their ability to win the next game, they are actually more probably going to win. So in mathematical terms, what we're saying is that the probability, the true probability at, t, at time t plus 1 is a certain function of a weighted sum of these individual beliefs, pi of t. And this function f, well, it can have any shape you want a priori. So let's take a sigmoidal curve here um, on, on this graph uh, with f of x equal x as a special limit, which would be the red, the red line. And the weights wi are some you know, weights, for example, 1 over n. And uh, this is not going to be very important for the rest. So in this model, uh, we're going again to find some kind of quasi ergodicity breaking because it's actually extremely close to uh, uh, Alan uh, and small. So we are faced here with, a, in a sense, a Keynes problem. Um, 
how should agents update their beliefs in the world where what other things others think it does affect the outcome and and so if you imagine that agents believe that the world is changing because people you know change change their opinion and so on uh, then the temptation is to imagine that you're going to discount far away past in the way you're trying to learn what's going on and so a simple rule uh, to learn uh, the probability for agent i is to say that pi of t plus one is what e thought at time t times one of minus lambda plus lambda uh, times one if the event happened and zero if it ha hasn't happened so this is you know, constant gain learning in some uh, uh, parts of the literature this is called also the exponential moving average and what we're adding to this is that agents occasionally mis make mistakes so they misconstrue uh, a, a one for a zero or equivalently they may die at some rate uh, epsilon so at large times what happens in this model is that if f of x is is a sigmoidal cup function uh, it's it's going to appear to converge to one of the two fixed points of this function the two stable fixed point this one or that one uh, but actually it's not it's not going to settle there uh, there's still going to be crises that keep happening but at, at a rate that ex that can be extremely small actually it's a rate that in this model is exponent oh uh, there's a lambda that's disappeared i don't know why but the formula here should be exponential minus some parameter a which depends on the full shape of the function f of x divided by lambda so what you see here is that if lambda is small if the learning rates if, if agents learn over long time uh, scales the, the, this crisis probability is going to be extremely small uh, exponentially small in one over lambda but what's even more interesting is that it's this, this rate this crisis rate is actually unknowable because because the parameter A is not known, nobody knows how the economy really works. So in order to compute A, you should be able to know the full shape of the function f that. So in my view, it's, it's a very simple model of radical uncertainty. People know that the, the, the system is going to switch one day or another, but it's just impossible in the small lambda limit to estimate this rate because it's going to depend sensi sensitively on the, on the value of A. It's a little bit like exponential sensitivity to uh, uh, initial conditions in chaotic systems. Uh, the special case f of x equal x actually maps to Allen's uh, model with, as I explained, flip-flops between uh, p equal 1 and p equal 0, now at a rate that's not given by lambda, but by 1 over epsilon, and this is something that we very recently compute to, uh, and I have uh, uh, to set the end. So what we ask ourselves uh, with uh, Roger is in such a world where, um, you know, essentially people can't learn what's going on. There's no common knowledge because uh, of this intrinsic unknowability of, uh, of the process of this quasi non agadisti that fools people into thinking that P is close to one uh, and, and they don't know when it's going to flip to the other fixed point then in this case, it's very reasonable to expect that agents uh, keep disagreeing. And what we ask ourselves is, can, if we introduce a, a market where they can bet and exchange their beliefs on what's going to happen, is the market can, can, can the market aggregate this um, knowledge, these different beliefs, and reveal the true value of, the, I mean, the value of the true probability CP at time t plus one. And so, okay, the story is a little complex and I have no time to describe it uh, here, but essentially what we find is that embedding this model in an economic setting where people can actually exchange assets and bet to, uh, on their beliefs leads to many interesting surprises like uh, strong wealth inequalities and excess volatility, and this is uh, what we're going to uh, explain in our forthcoming paper. So finally, let me uh, tell you a little bit about a recent model that we studied um, uh, as well, um, about self-trapping and what I will explain uh, why it's called weak agonist deep rating. So you can think of that as a model of ha habit formation. Um, so imagine an agent has n choices, xi. Uh, so think, for example, of these choices as, as restaurants, you can uh, go and have lunch. 
And what we're going to assume is that the utility of, of choice i depends on how often that choice was made in the past. Actually, this is close again to ideas that Alan has promoted on uh, loyalty formation. So the utility of, of xi, of restaurant xi at time t, is a kind of uh, initial utility times a, a factor that takes into account the number of times that you visited uh, x phi in the past. So this is the, this, this uh, kernel here. And phi is a kind of memory kernel that tells you that maybe if you visited this restaurant a long time ago, uh, it doesn't count anymore in your assessment of its quality. And now these agents, they're able to make, um, uh, to change their choice. So the new choice is going to be, going to be made uniformly uh, among all other possible choices, but with a logistic transition rate or a standard in choice theory. So the priority to actually move from choice xi to choice xj is going to be given by this uh, logistic function, which tells you that you're going to favor uh, restaurants with a higher utility, but sometimes you may flip and uh, beta, uh, if beta is, is very large, then you'll never, you, you just go to the best one uh, to date. And if beta is, is close to zero, then you, you, you randomly uh, switch. There's a normalization here. Um, so, so what I'm going to discuss um, and that what we've studied in the paper is a, a special case, a special, special specification of uh, this kernel 5t, which we take as a power law. So c over 1 plus t to the gamma, because this power law is flexible enough to give a variety of different behavior. Um, so what one finds in this model um, is that if gamma is greater than 1, so if memory decays fast enough, and this includes actually functions that would decay faster than a power law, like an exponential. Then what you find is that the average trapping time, the time on average that you spend at choosing a given restaurant um, uh, over all the other ones, is actually finite, and the dynamics is ergodic. So all the possible choices are going to be explored, and asymptotically, these choices will be explored with some Boltzmann Gibbs type of, uh, of measure. Uh, on the other hand, if gamma is less than one, that is, if the memory decays sufficiently slowly, then the system self traps forever in, in a unique choice, which might not be the best one uh, a priori, but just because you've gone to the restaurant, uh, to that particular restaurant, you're going to kind of form loyalty, as Alan would uh, describe it, and you're going to continue going to that restaurant for the mere uh, reason that you've gone there before. And my personal ex experience is that this actually often happens. Uh, so in this case, you have agonistic breaking. Instead of visiting all possible choices according to some uh, Gibbs distribution, you actually visit one and you keep, well, you, at the beginning, there's a little bit of shuffling, and then you get trapped in one of them. Could I, could I just ask a question, JP? So what would it mean, if you go back to that last slide, what would it mean for a choice to be the best in some sense? I'm sorry? What would it be? What would it mean for one choice to be the best one? Well, so U0 is supposed to be, in a sense, the true utility of that restaurant, right? But because of this self trapping, you're going to end up in a restaurant that is not necessarily the best one. It so there, is, becomes, there, is, there is a truth that you're learning about. You're trying to learn it, but because of this memory here, yeah. actually, you never learn it in the gamma less than one phase. You get yeah. stuck. Um, so, the interesting case is when gamma is exactly equal to 1, and then there's a, an agonistic transition between two phases as a function of beta, this intensity of choice parameter. And it so happens that uh, when beta is greater than 1 over c, when c is, is this parameter here, uh, you find the same result as before, you get trapped in, in one uh, choice. Uh, but what happens is actually described by, by this, these little um, formulas here. If you call P of T capital T, the probability that the choice that you make has never changed between capital T and capital T plus T, 
then at the transition, when data is equal to data star, this property takes the following form. It's a, a function of small t over capital T, and it's a function that actually, for a given capital T, goes to zero for large small t. So you end up leaving the, 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 the choice you made at, at time capital T, but it's a very slow process, and you see that there's this strange non-commutation of the two limits. So capital T usually in, in physics is called the age of the system. It's how how much you've waited before uh, actually asking yourself this uh, question. And so this property curly P is a function of small t over capital T, which means that depending on how you take small t or capital T to infinity, according to which one you take to infinity first, you're going to, to have different results. So if you take capital T to infinity first, then this function is going to be one, you're going to get stuck. But if you take capital T finite and then take T to infinity, it's going to go to zero. And so this is something that I call weak capacity breaking uh, and aging uh, in a different context. Uh, for ca capital T fixed, you actually go to zero at, at, at a long time. So it's a, an interesting scenario, which is in between agonistic breaking and full agonist. And, and so in this model, one can also compute what happens in the strong agonistic uh, breaking phase. So let me just wrap up. Uh, I try to present different simple models where one observes either strong trapping, where reinforcement uh, traps you in a state where uh, there's no no intrinsic reason to end up with some probability of drawing a white ball in the poly urn model, but it's just because of this reinforcement thing that you uh, end up there. So this is a strong agonistic breaking. Um, but I've also shown you that when you add errors or noises, as in Alan's uh, model, this epsilon, then you create escape routes that are rare and that interestingly can sometimes depend exponentially on parameters. So in a way, this rate of exit is unknowable. And this leads to uh, uh, dynamics that looks very non ergodic at small times, but at very long times, you realize that actually it's, it's, it's a bona fide ergodic dynamics. But for practical purposes, you might not care about the fact that it's actually ergodic. And then this, this strange uh, intermediate phase where there's weak habits breaking, where the relaxation time, where the time you need to escape, depends on the age of the system. So um, the, the logic of all this is that, um, as been alluded to earlier by uh, Roger and Alan, most economic or econometric models implicitly assume agonicity when non agonic behavior is actually very often observed. observed. Uh, so I gave examples here, but if you do, for example, agent-based models of the economy, then you end up finding these non-agonic uh, behavior uh, very easily. So, for example, we have uh, we are now studying a, a model for uh, recovery after the crisis, and you can end up getting stuck in, in a phase where the economy is malfunctioning for a very, very long time for exactly the same kind of mechanisms that I've uh, alluded to uh, today. You can also, you know, get these black swans, which in a way is, is another way to uh, uh, to think about non Uh So we believe uh, that uh, richer non ergodic dynamics may shed light on various puzzles, like uh, because agents are de facto unable to learn true probabilities, or they get trapped into in suboptimal choices. So thank you for listening to me, and if you're interested, I've listed a few uh, papers here. Thanks very much, JP. Um, so if anyone has any uh, questions or suggestions, just put them on the chat and, uh, and they will get forwarded to us. So um, uh, does anybody have any interesting thoughts? Adam, I'm sure you have. Your mic is, you're muted, Alan. Yep, there you go. Is that better? Yeah. I'm, I'm unmuted. Yeah, just two very quick remarks. When we looked at um, people making choices in the fish market, remember, um, and they would go to different sellers, and depending on a parameter that you, you've already mentioned, uh, 
they would either get rush off and get stuck with uh, one particular seller. But what happened actually in the, in the short run, that's where they got stuck. And if there were three sellers and there were 30 buyers and they wouldn't get stuck at 10, 10, 10, they would get stuck maybe at some different numbers. But if you ran it for very, very long, then of course, in the end, you got down to 10, 10, 10 on average at these uh, different sellers. So in some sense, in a very long run, there was some sort of a good Yeah, that's exactly what I tried to say. Yeah, that's right. So that's a, I think that that's one thing. The other thing I just want to mention was Hans Fulmer's contribution was to say, yeah, but supposing this epsilon is important, then people say to you, oh, yeah, but you're introducing this randomness, which doesn't come from anywhere. But his trick was to let the um, epsilon go to zero as you had more and more people. So that when you had an, a sort of very large population, the uh, little disturbance term hardly played any role in some sense. Well, then in this case, you would have, a, well, that's exactly the point I was trying to make here, that in this case, uh, you would get uh, an ergodic time which grows with the size of the population. Right. So, yeah. so epsilon would be one over n when n is the size of the population. So the, the, the time to actually flip would be n. Right. So in a way, this is what Juan Pegaran was talking about. In some cases, the, 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 the only way the system can get non agotic truly is when n goes to infinity, when the size of the system goes, goes to infinity. Okay, I'm just seeing, I, unless anybody has a final question. Uh, hang on, I've got one coming in. I don't know who it's from. Um, to JP, is there a difference between trying to learn a truth and an existence of a truth? To learn between a truth and? Non-existence of a truth. Uh, well, I'm not sure how to answer, to, to answer that question. Who, who, I guess I'm not sure either. Um, so in, in our model, agents try to you know, to, to learn the true key. And, and what we show is that even with the market, they're actually unable to learn this true key. Um, that this is the thing that we found interesting is that markets are, in this model, unable to reveal uh, the true key, even if they aggregate a large number of, of beliefs. I mean, I, I think there are some fascinating questions with that second, that last model that you put up there, which has to do with genuine preferences. Um, and when I asked you the question, what do you mean by truth? And this is related to the question that just came in. Um, there are some, in some sense, economists are terrified to move away from the notion of fixed preference orderings because they give us the Pareto theorems and they let us make this distinction between what we call objective and subjective decisions. Uh, objective decisions are ones where you are simply making choices that. Um, that maximize your own utility function, and a human being is a utility function. As soon as we start letting in this backdoor mechanism whereby uh, pe people's preference orderings are essentially changing through social interaction, we completely lose the Pareto criterion. And I think economists are terrified to be in that landscape, but it's one that we should learn to be in because it's one that social scientists in general have been inhabiting for generations. By the way, you see that in this model, actually agents don't interact. There's a single agent which interacts with its own past in a sense. Yeah. But you can then actually add some social interaction where what, what other people choose, what other people like, is can affect your own uh, choice ordering. Mm -hmm. And this could lead to an even more interesting model. Fascinating. Anyway, thank you so much. And um, with that, um, we will move on. <laughs> JP? Somebody is very noisy. I think it's you, JP. Okay, that's quiet. So uh, we will now move on to our sixth and final uh, viewpoint on, uh, on ergodicity from um, Rosemary Harris of Queen Mary University. Uh, Thinking about optimal decision making with distorted memory. So, Rosemary, take it away. Thanks very much. Okay, so 
I'm going to be talking to you about some ideas to do with memory. And memory in a very simple model for decision making. So I'm not an economist, so my model for decision making looks roughly like the cartoon on the, the blackboard behind me. But I'm going to be telling you in particular about how to go from so-called peak end rule of behavioral economics to a non-Markovian random walk. And within the framework of that model, we'll think about two different scenarios. One, the case where the choices are homogeneous in the sense that there's not one choice that's a priori better than the other. And we're going to be interested there in the role of noise in decision making. Does an agent keep on switching between decisions? Or to borrow the language of the, the previous speaker, do you get trapped by force of habit in one or other choice? And you'll see actually there are quite deep connections to what we heard in the previous talk. And then towards the end, I'll talk about more recent work on heterogeneous choices. So this is work uh, with Vangelis Mitsakapas, who's a PhD student at Queen Mary. And the other stakes are a lot higher. We care whether there's an op optimal value of noise, and we care more, in the context of this workshop at least, about ergodicity growth. And I should say that the funding for the first part comes from this grant called Reflect from some years ago. It's got a very long name. I'm not going to be telling you about, about sand pits or about travel behavior, but I will start by saying something about utility. And of course, to the, the current audience, that's probably not, not really necessary. We know that utility has its roots in the, the greatest happiness principle of good old Jeremy Bentham. Here's a picture I normally show of him, but actually he's just moved. So this is him in his, his new home. I think this is the Student Inquiry Centre in UCL. You know, moved him to this new perspect box. It was very controversial back in February when these were the most important things universities had to worry about. But nowadays, of course, we understand utility a little bit more precisely as a measure of satisfaction or benefit you get from a particular choice or receiving a particular good. And the idea, as we've already had alluded to quite a lot today, is that that utility affects your future choices, that you make choices somehow to maximize this utility. But the problem is that the utility you use to make choices might not be the same as the utility you actually experience partly because you mispredict what's going to happen, but also because you misremember what happened in the past. And that brings us on to the, the famous peak end rule, introduced by Daniel Kahneman. And some of the original experiments that are supposed to provide evidence for this are not on happiness or benefit, but they're on pain. In particular, they're on pain during colonoscopies. So what these guys did was they took a bunch of patients who I'm told had to have colonoscopies anyway and at every minute during the procedure so while the probe was being moved around in their backside they asked them how horrible how painful how unpleasant it was so this is a kind of Forrest Johnson graph there's nothing on this axis but it's basically a pain axis and they plotted then these graphs of pain against time for different patients and then when the whole thing was over they went back to the, the patients and they said, can you, can you rate that experience with a, a single number on some scale? And we might look at this and say, well, OK, this is pain against time. The area under the graph is integrated pain. So obviously, for example, patient B has a worse experience than patient A. But in fact, that's not what they found. They found that a very good predictor of how people retrospectively evaluated their experience was simply to take the, the worst bit, the most horrible bit, and what was going on in the last minute or so, and to take a straight average of those things. And that's this so-called peak end rule. In particular, the length of the experience didn't really seem to play a role. And they even tested this kind of proactively by, by leaving the probe inside people longer than was necessary, but making the end bit very, very gentle. And then people went away happier. So you give them more pain, but somehow they prefer that uh, because it gives them a better memory. And this, this peak end rule idea has been tested in, in lots of happier scenarios as well. So things like how people evaluate TV commercials and how you remember your holidays, the idea being that you remember perhaps the best bit and the journey home. And I think in some cases it seems to work fairly well, in other cases a bit less well. But certainly what is clear is that as humans, we don't 
remember everything that's happened to us in the past. And we don't just remember the most recent things, but that somehow extreme events play a particular role. And what we're going to do in this talk is investigate how this kind of memory affects decision making in the future. And in particular, the peak part of the memory. I won't say much about end memory, but you can, you can ask me afterwards if you like. So here's my model. Here are the ingredients of the model. I have a single agent, of the sort we saw in the previous talk, who has a choice of only two things, and I'll call them plus or minus. And this model is a situation where there's repeated decision making. So two similar products or two modes of transport, you're making a choice repeatedly. And we keep track of the number of times the agent takes the plus choice, and selects plus, and the number of times he makes a minus choice. And he's got to make a choice at every time step. So, of course, we have this equality here. And if you think about this for about five seconds, you convince yourself that this is just like having a random walk where you can take a step to the right, plus choice, or a step to the left, and we keep track of the, the number of steps right and the number of steps left. Turns out to be a little bit cleaner to think instead about the fraction of steps right and the fraction of steps left, or the velocity, which is of course the, the difference of those things in this random walk picture. So far, so boring. Now the crucial ingredient is that every time the, the agent makes a choice, whether the choice is plus or minus, we draw a new value for a utility random variable. So he gets a new experience every time he makes a choice. And that's from some known CDF that might in general be different for the plus choices or the right choices and for the left choices. Every time he makes a choice, he has a new utility for that choice from some distribution. And the really important thing, the agent remembers the maximum of his experiences, but separately the maximum for the right steps, which I'll call u hat plus, and the maximum for the left steps, which I'll call u hat minus. So the hat here is the maximum of all the experiences for the relevant choice. And it's that maximum, that peak memory, that we then feed into the decision making, the probability for what happens next. So I take these probabilities for step right and left, according to a logic distribution, just like we saw in the last talk, where capital T here is the level of noise, so the temperature, so the inverse of the, the beta parameter we had before. And you can see that if capital T is, is very large, so if there's lots and lots of noise, then you're not really paying any attention to your memory. This is going to be about half, and this is going to be about half. And then you have something that looks like an ordinary random walk, sampling both choices equally likely. But if capital T is smaller, then you have a bias in the direction of whichever is bigger. So it's a positive of u hat plus and u hat minus. So it's a positive reinforcement, where if you remember having a better experience to the right, you're more likely to go right in the future. And a question you might ask is, well, what happens to this model in the long time limit? And we'll focus now for a bit on the, the case of homogeneous choices. Well, in that case, my utility distribution is the same for the right steps and for the left steps. But, and this is important, in general, the distributions of the maxima will be different because they depend on the number of right and left steps I've taken so far. And then you might just sort of think heuristically about what you might expect to happen in the long time limit. And you might say one of two things. First of all, you might say, well, hang on, this is essentially symmetric. So probably what happens in the long time limit as I, as I end up with u hat plus being asymptotically the same as u hat minus, and then this will be the same probability as this one. They'll both look like a half. I'll have an ordinary random walk. I'll make half my steps right, half my steps left, and I'll be in a kind of mixed decision state. On the other hand, perhaps it's possible, and this alludes to things we heard earlier, that you have a particularly good experience for one of the choices. Let's say you have a particularly good experience for the right choice. And you then think, well, this is the way to go. You're much more likely to go right. And then you're much more likely to have an even better experience, to sample more from the right distribution to, so to see something further in the tail. So then you'd be even more likely to go to the right. And perhaps it's possible that you can get sucked into a state 
where you become totally convinced that right is the only way to go, and you have fraction one steps right in the long time limit, or fraction one steps left in the long term limit. And this would be a kind of frozen decision state where you're, you're trapped, you're frozen into a particular decision. And if you play around with simulations, indeed, this is the kind of thing you see. So on the right here, you see an empirical histogram of the velocity um, for the case where both of these distributions are exponential with the same parameter. And you see that in the, the high noises, so look at the green points, you see a peak about zero velocity. So something that looks quite like the kind of picture you get for an ordinary random walk. On the other hand, for a low noise, red points, you see something that sharply peaks to the two sides. So peaked about minus one and plus one. And this is after only a hundred time steps. So the peaks get sharper if you go to longer times. So the question really is, well, is this a general thing or is this just some special case? How does it depend on the noise and how does it depend on the distribution of the utility? And that's quite a hard question in general, at least for me. But there's a simplification which enables us to see something about what's going on. So that's the following approximation. I replace my maximum values, my u hat plus and u hat minus, which are random variables which fluctuate, by the so-called characteristic largest value after that number of steps right and left. In other words, I say, well, supposing I've made x plus steps right so far, I've drawn x plus trials from my right CDF, what typically will be the largest value I see? And that's given by the value u plus that solves this equation, and similarly for the characteristic largest value for the left steps. And if you make this an approximation, you're, you're throwing out some fluctuations, but you're now in a much simpler case because p plus and p minus are deterministic functions of the number of steps right and left or equivalently, if you like, of the, the velocity you've had in the past in time. So you now have a random walker whose future dynamics depend on the fraction of steps right and left in the past. And if you're a physicist, you might say, okay, this reminds me of this thing called the elephant random walk, random walker which never forgets. And this is a kind of generalized elephant random walker. On the other hand, if you're a mathematician or if you were listening in the previous talk, you say, Actually, this is just a, a kind of weird nonlinear poly problem, which has been around, of course, for much longer. And once you've made this simplification, then you can solve for the fixed points and you can check their stability. So let's see how that works for the case where the, the choices are homogeneous and from an exponential distribution. And in that case, the U's have CDF, ordinary exponential CDF, so they wouldn't with mean one over lambda. You can find the characteristic largest values very easily. They go like the logarithm of the number of steps right and left. Interestingly, this, interesting, this logarithm is what you get when you do the sum of the one over t in the memory kernel of the previous talk. So there's a connection there, which we'll see more of later. So now you have characteristic largest values, and then you can substitute those in to your expressions for p plus and p minus. And in particular, you can find an expression for the mean movement in the next step. And that's the thing I call delta. And that, of course, depends on the velocity in the past. But in this case, it's very simple. You get a hyperbolic time function. And then you say, OK, well, at a fixed point, what I do next on average has got to be the same as what I did on, in the past on average. So for a fixed point, this thing had better be equal to b. And you solve that. And you get indeed the fixed points that we anticipated earlier, one of zero, symmetric one, and asymmetric ones of plus and minus one. And then as usual with fixed points, and we saw these kind of pictures earlier, you ask, well, are they stable? And to do that, you need to know about the slope of this function. And that's very easy to find, at least for the symmetric fixed point, it looks like one over lambda t. And that means that we predict a phase transition at a critical value of the noise. So if the noise is greater than one over lambda, that means that this thing is less than one, which means we're in this scenario here, where the symmetric fixed point is stable, fluctuations away from it tend to be brought back. On the other hand, the noise smaller than one over lambda, 
the symmetric fixed point is unstable, and we tend to be driven away from that towards the asymmetric fixed points. So that's the, the prediction of this simple model. Let's check how well it works. So what I plot here is simulation results showing that the root mean square of the velocity against noise. And on the left, you have simulating directly this simplified model. And what you see is that this RMS quantity indeed looks like a kind of order parameter. So the exponential parameter here is one, so we predict a phase transition at one. The values of noise above that, then as we look at longer and longer times, so these are times, as we increase the times, the root mean square gets smaller and smaller. In other words, we get closer and closer to a delta function about zero. On the other hand, below the critical point, then as we increase time, the root mean square converges to one, corresponding to delta peaks of plus and minus one, the asymmetric fixed points. Then on the right-hand side, I show you the same thing for the full model. And you see that you see roughly the same. For noise less than the one, you seem to see convergence to one, like we saw here. But there's something different going on for high noises in that the, the root mean square converges not to zero like it did here, but to some finite value. And of course, that's because we threw away information about fluctuations in the maximum value. And in this case, you can do, do a bit more there. You can say, well, the maximum has a gumball distribution, and that determines the width of this velocity peak and the long time limit, and you can approximate it with this dashed line here. But in any case, the simplified model gives us some information about the, the quantitative things we see in the full model. What about other distributions? Well, you don't have to do it for every distribution you think about, because you can leverage the power of extreme value theory to say that at least for the simplified model, you expect three universal classes. If your utility distribution has fat tails, ratio distribution, for example, then you predict that the agent eventually becomes frozen in one choice regardless of the level of noise. And that kind of makes sense. If you have fat tails, then at some point you're going to see something way in the tail for one of your choices. You're going to think this is brilliant. You're going to be much, much more likely to go in that direction. And then you're going to see something even further in the tail, and you become even more overwhelmingly likely to take that choice. So you become trapped. On the other hand, if your utility distribution is bounded, so for example, a uniform distribution, got some finite upper bound, then in the long time limit, the model predicts that the agent samples both choices approximately equally, again, regardless of the noise. And that makes sense if you have a, a maximum utility. And if you wait long enough, and you might have to wait a very long time, then you'll have seen essentially that maximum for both your left choices and your right choices. And then you'll have an ordinary random walk with probability half of going in each direction. And this is borne out again by looking at simulations for the root mean square. But the interesting case is the exponential case, where we do indeed see a transition from a frozen, from a trapped state to a mixed state as we increase the noise. Okay, so we're almost out of time, so I better say something about ergodicity. Well, this simplified model suggests that even for the case of homogeneous choices, if I have fat tailed utility distributions or exponential utilities with noise below some critical value, then I have ergodicity breaking. In the sense that I have a, a trapping where the time average velocity for a specific agent is not the same as the average over the whole ensemble. And you can see that, of course, if you look back at this plot for the exponential case, in the red points corresponding to low noise, if I'm an individual agent, then in the long time limit, I'm either going to be found sitting at minus one or plus one. But the average for the whole thing will be zero. So I have um, negativity breaking in that sense. But it doesn't really matter because for the homogeneous case, the average utility for left steps is, is the same as the average utility for right steps. So it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to have the same average utility. And that begs the question for the last minute or two, what about the case of heterogeneous choices? So we're going to concentrate on exponential distributions because they're the most interesting. 
And what I plot here is the expected ensemble average utility per time step against noise for a case where I have an exponential distribution of utility with mean a half for the right steps and mean one for less steps. So if all I care about is maximizing the, the, the average, then left is the, the correct choice. And you see again that the simplified model and the full model have roughly the same um, features. In particular, if you, you look at noise going to zero, then you see these lines go to 0.75. And that's very easy to understand because as noise goes to zero, you're basically trapped in whatever your first choice is. So half the agents will make their first step to the right, and then they'll have an average one over lambda plus. The other half will make their first step to the left, and they'll have an average one over lambda minus. And they'll never be able to escape in this limit. On the other hand, as noise goes to infinity, then just like we saw before, we have an ordinary random walk. So each agent will spend half of its steps going to the right and half of its steps going to the left, and it will have the same average. So the ensemble average will be the same as the agent average. So that explains the two ends, but in the middle, you see a peak. And it's a peak that's particularly pronounced for, for finite time. So this is after 10 time steps, after 100 time steps, after 1,000. So that means there really is an optimal value of noise, which enables you to explore the, the dynamical utility landscape just enough to find the right choice and then to be trapped in that. Even more interestingly, as we go to longer and longer times, the height of the peak goes to one. So it's not just optimal, it's perfect in the sense that you have no probability of being trapped in the bad choice. And you can try to understand that again by analyzing the simplified model. You no longer have the symmetric fixed point, but you have can solve the time dependent solutions to this equation, which gives you stable or unstable trajectories. And then you predict three regimes a low noise regime to the left of this blue dashed line, where the expected ensemble average utility is less than one. So you're trapped. But as you increase the, the noise, you have more chance of getting out of the bad trap, if you like, into the good trap, until you reach one over lambda plus, which is where you always can escape. And then there's an intermediate noise regime where the ensemble average goes to one, as one over time, and a high noise regime where we predict that the ensemble average also goes to one, but with a power law which is slower and gets slower the larger the value of the noise you have. And we've checked these power laws in the simplified model. Okay, so just to conclude, we've seen, just like the previous talk, that reinforcement leads to trapping, non ergodicity several different classes of behavior, and I think you can map those to the classes of behavior um, seen in the previous talk and the associated preprint. And for the interesting case where you have different distributions for choices in the different directions, particularly exponential distributions, you really can be trapped in the wrong choice. But for finite times, there's, a, there's an optimal value of noise which minimizes that, that probability of being trapped wrongly. And in the long time limits, you get this, this ideal behavior for all values of noise above that critical value. Other distributions, by the way, are much more boring. And there are lots of extensions, many of which were already talked about in the, the end of the previous talk, and lots of very valid questions about how relevant this is for, for real behavior. But I'll stop there and thank for questions. That's really fascinating, Rosemary. Thanks. I, I, I'm really struck by the similarities between everything that has been going on in the whole three hours, particularly the similarity between what you're doing and what JP and I are doing uh, using the same mathematics. Does, it, does anyone have any questions or thoughts or Robert or Ian, anyone? I think you really can map the transition that, 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 that JP found in his trapping model to the, to the one that I see, uh, because he has this memory kernel that goes as one over T, and when mm -hmm. you sum over that, you, you get a log, which is basically equivalent to the, to the log I have here. So the utility that's going into the future decisions goes as a logarithm in both cases. And mm -hmm. I, check, I check the other cases they see as well, and, and you, can, you can map those across. 
um, to the, the kind of things I see here. Robert, Ian, comments, anyone, Alan? Okay, I'll ask a comment, but uh, I think it's a comment on the last two talks. Um, I'm muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so it's, it's on the last two talks, so similarity or whatever, but um, when you talk about weak ergodicity or ergodicity breaking, you've obviously got an ergodic measure in, you've obviously got an invariant measure in mind in the first place. Now, I can see that if everything goes to zero, you might not want to call that a gothic, even though it is a gothic with respect to a very boring measure. But are you sure that all the things you call a gothic are really a gothic? Yeah, I mean, I think as we've seen, there's, there's, there's different language in use in different fields. I'm basically um, using, if you like, the physicist's definition I of Actually, I a, a gothic, mm. meaning that the ensemble average is the same as the, as the time average. And I think you could make it a, 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 write that more precisely. Um, in your language, but I haven't tried to do it for this particular model. All right, but then what, I, I think it's more in economics. I don't understand why in economics, why how people even know what measure to compute the um, ensemble average with respect to. Why do you think that? Well, because um, I mean, I told you, in Hamilton, in sort of in physics, you have um, Louisville measure or whatever. So you've got a natural ergodic measure that you you've got a natural invariant measure that you want to refer to when you're saying that something's a god equal is it but in economic uh, the, way, the way that it's applied in economic models is not that dissimilar i mean if, if you just think of the way that let me take a very boring model which is a real business cycle model that became uh sort of entered into economics about 30 40 years ago um in which the, the, there's a stochastic measure that um that is all generated by some deus ex machina which is a productivity shock um, and, and objects are being chosen by people along the way, and they're interacting in some way, and in some cases, only one person. But the, the objects that we're thinking about all end up in some ergodic measure. And um, I, I think what we're trying, what JP, I think we've lost JP, but what he and I are trying to do um, is, is to introduce notions where interacting agents uh, are altering um the the outcomes in ways that could lead to some uh or got a godic measure or could not and and um and i found particularly interesting from everything i've heard um to learn much more about the the idea that it just may take a very very long time for people to learn about some godic measure uh, i've got a question coming in from giorgio uh, who asks, using utilities correlated in time, one can get different distributions for the maximum, such as the Tracy, Tracy Weedon. Any thoughts on interpretation of this or possible outcomes? I don't even know what that means. So. Yeah, I, 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 know, I know what the question means and I know what the Tracy Weedon distribution is. Um, I think all sorts of things could happen and I, I haven't really explored it. Um, so. In my in my model, the utilities work were independent from step to step. Of course, you could have have time correlations. Uh, my guess. Just tell us what Tracy Woodham distribution is for those of us who are ignorant. So it's a distribution that, and others will correct me, but it arises um, when you look at things like the the maximum eigenvalue of particular random matrices. So it's a it's a it's a distribution that pops up um, when you're looking at the maximum correlated random variables. Um, my 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 hunch is if you had um, Correlation over short time scales, then it wouldn't really change things very much. Uh, but if you have correlation over time scales that scale somehow with the, the length of the, of the history, then I think all bets are off. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, if there's no last questions, uh, anyone want uh, to? Yeah. yeah. Really. Alan and Robert. So Alan will say something, then Robert. And I think Robert's going to wrap up for us. Yeah, it's very, I was going to say something very rapid, which is that in the, at some point in that we were asked, well, what happens if there isn't a true value? You remember this? And, and so how do we learn about something that's not the true value? And I think what that person probably had in mind was when you have, uh, for example, some price or other, which is dependent on how many people are forecasting something or how many people yeah. are uh, choosing it. And therefore, there's no underlying true value they're just learning about 
what the sort of majority is looking for. You know, you know the sort of Keynes beauty kind of content, that sort of idea. So then there would be no true value, and it would just depend on what people settle on collectively. And I, I suspect that that was uh, what was going on. And then you, and you don't actually need to have some underlying specific true value that you're learning about. You may be learning about what other people are learning about. And with regard to tastes, I think you could think about that as a model of fashion. Right. Robert, would you like to, to yeah. wrap up? Yeah, so I just had one uh, comment and then a final remark. Um, so the comment is that, uh, Rosemary, it seems to me the dynamics you're studying is not stationary because it depends on the time since time zero. Exactly. So, so um, normally one wouldn't allow oneself to talk about ergodicity. It's not stationary. Of course, I did say earlier that uh, you can extend concepts of at least mixing. Uh, maybe ergodicity too, I didn't think about that. But um, you can extend mixing to the time inhomogeneous case. But uh, yeah, do you have any? Questions? I mean, would you would you use ergodicity with relation to the poly range, for example? Well, I'd have the same problem okay, with. Uh, so so I, I, I hide, I hide yeah. behind behind um, other people who follow the the, the same yeah. the, the same. Yeah, I'd, I'd have the same. I, I, I agree that in a in a, a strict mathematical sense, that the the, the issues. Yeah. Okay, so so now I have a question for both of you. So. Uh, in, in in some version of the poly earn model that, that we were following up with, actually it's Alan's model, I think, with 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 some noise. There is a there is a a stationary invariant measure that you get to uh, in the long run. Is that not an example of ergodicity in some sense? Yeah, my memory is in talking with you earlier, Roger, several months ago, then I did decide that one of your models. Is uh, stationary, yeah. But I forget now how I sorted that out in my mind. I mean, that's that's certainly something that I would like to think about about some more. So, in the full model, rather than the simplified model, the simplified model is just the polyurn model, certainly not stationary. But in the full model, you have this this added noise. And it's a little bit complicated noise because it comes from the distribution of the maxima. Yeah. But there, in at least some cases, you do seem to to approach some some stationary distribution. So, I think this might put you in the the category of this this quasi ergodicity breaking in JP's language rather than, than so is it is it true Rosemary in your full model that in the situation where in the simple model um, you converge to zero or one is it true that in the full model you you converge to some sort of u-shaped thing like a beta distribution in which you spend a lot of time around zero and a lot of time around one Yes, but it doesn't seem to be a beta distribution. We tried, we tried to fit, and we tried to prove that it, it went to beta. So yeah, so so we had that same issue, and it's so we we did simulations for the discrete model. We couldn't find any closed forms, but JP managed to find a closed form by going to the continuous time limit, and it was beta in the continuous time limit. Yeah, so there, so there might be some something there, but I haven't explored it in detail. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think uh, we should draw this to a close. I'd like to say a big uh, thank you to uh, all our speakers. Thank you very much. And a uh, big thank you to all participants for coming along. Uh, but um, I'd like to say a particular thank you to Carla and Richard at uh, NISA for managing the registrations and the Zoom session. So I could, uh, throw in there. Was, I could just throw in there quickly and interrupt. That's actually, it's rebuilding macro housed at NISA. And Angus asked me to put in a particular plug because, um, uh, sorry about that, didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, okay, yeah, so the rebuilding macro program, which is housed in NISA, yeah. So anyway, a big round of applause for, uh, particularly for Carla and Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And um, those people listening in, this is all being recorded and will go up on the RM website in a couple of days. So.